गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन इट्स अ प्लेजर सो गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन एंड इट्स प्लेजर टू वेलकम यू ऑल हेयर एट आई सी जीवी इन डेली द वर्कशॉप दिस इज ऑर्गेनाइज टूडे इट्स प्रोबेबली द फर्स्ट वर्कशॉप which we are hosting completely offline after this uh, covid uh, pandemic and this is also first workshop in a in this series of dbt sponsored international workshop so it's uh, the in this series there will be 12 workshops which will be organized in 2022 and it has been supported by partner by technology government of india and key feature of this workshop is hands on training which we will see actually working on spectrometer and doing all the experiments we have set up and some of the things which will be done here also it's like four parameters and everything we have set in the processing which you can do and you can download all the softwares which are freely available we have provided a link in the uh, notebook which has been given to you the manual and all the details are there so now i request uh, so before we move on there is something which we start with that for paying homage to professor m vijay and we just keep uh, one minute silence who passed away yesterday and he was a doyan of structure biology in india and has made immense contribution to the field so please shops in a year uh, with about 
15 to 20 students is not adequate. You have to increase the capacity. And after a lot of discussions, Department of Biotechnology decided to provide additional support for conducting these workshops. So as an initial step uh, for conducting these workshops in 2019, they gave us for a duration of two years uh, about six workshops each year. So in that sense, in addition to four workshops that we were conducting uh, with support from ICGB, uh, we were to conduct another. So in a year, that would have been about uh, 10 workshops, which will be one in a month. And that would be something like a series of courses that Cold Spring Harbor Symposium, Cold Spring Harbor laboratory organizers, and they have been very popular. So we were sort of trying to aim in that order. Unfortunately, <coughs> the COVID pandemic set in, and uh, since we were to do it in real space, uh, international travel became near impossible, almost impossible. And uh, we could, uh, we had no choice but to postpone this. We could have arranged this in uh, virtual, but that uh, wasn't uh, uh, really objective of uh, having this. So we decided to postpone it with uh, uh, information to the Department of Biotechnology. Then we made a schedule for 2021. We couldn't. Uh, uh, because the second wave came in 2021, so uh, <coughs> that also got postponed. Finally, in a challenging step, uh, we decided to conduct these workshops almost back to back in the next two to three months, at least six of them. And this is the first of those. So in May and June, we'll have a series of meetings, so we will be fully occupied doing <coughs> doing these activities uh, in a very intense manner, in a wide range of topics. The, uh, the reason for emphasizing on uh, having these advanced workshops for training people in new areas in biotechnology is because uh, if we look at uh, the people who have been trained in uh, ICGB for, uh, in bi areas of biotechnology, they have actually gone uh, uh, ahead and become uh, veteran, uh, very remarkable uh, scientists themselves and they have actually uh, uh, told us uh, that uh, one of the major uh, turning point for their careers were attending these workshops in ICGB. So they have been successful and that is one of the reason uh, why we decided to do it. Unfortunately, this uh, setback of uh, uh, COVID pandemic uh, poured uh, 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 some kind of uh, disappointing uh, thing. But nevertheless, I think uh, my colleagues have uh, come about and tried to compensate for it by having it uh, in uh, this year. And I think uh, I'm very happy to see that we are meeting today in physical mode to have the first of the workshop. So particularly for those of you who are not familiar with ICGB, I should also tell you the history and background of ICGB. ICGB was sort of developing world's answer to the growth of biotechnology in Western countries. And there is a lot of developments took place in 80s and 90s in uh, uh, particularly uh, companies like Genentech and many others started developing and it appeared the, the tomorrow's weapon for uh, development was uh, uh, biotechnology and some people got together and set up this institution uh, International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology for uh, the purpose of helping the developing uh, the, the, the initially for five years UNIDO supported this mission and uh, one uh, component laboratory was set up in uh, uh, Trieste, uh, Italy and uh, the other was set up in New Delhi 
and over a period of last uh, 30 to 33 years, this was set up in 1987 and 88, but, and since then we have had tremendous development. ICGB works in um, major two domains over a period of 33 years. One is on human health and other is agriculture. And we have contributed both to the fundamental research as well as translational research. There are many uh, developments in uh, diagnostics and vaccines that have been done, particularly from the Delhi component. In fact, major uh, diagnostic kit all over the world uh, for dengue uh, is from ICGB New Delhi. We transferred about uh, six years back uh, technology for dengue vaccine, uh, recombinant dengue vaccine for clinical developments to the Sun Pharmaceutical uh, about uh, five years ago. So we have ICGB as a whole, the, the trace component has actually developed particular biosimilars. So we have been very successful in building a strong uh, foundation for fundamental research and also being able to translate into real products which actually are available at a cheaper price in the entire developing world as well as in the developed countries. So that has been the strength and which uh, we is also translated through programs like this where we provide training to the people and people from uh, uh, Korea, Bangladesh, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia and uh, whole of Africa and South America have come and taken training and gone uh, from here. Not only the training in terms of short-term courses, but we do have a very robust uh, PhD program. At any given time, uh, we have about 150 PhD students. Many of them are Indian, but quite a few of them are international students. We do have a postdoctoral fellowship program, which is supported for international students by the ICGB. As well as we do take uh, postdoctoral fellows uh, from within India. We have several M.K. Ban fellows, we have Ramalita Swami fellows, and so on and so forth. So we have uh, fantastic training activities, uh, remarkable research, and uh, real uh, translational research that is going on in ICGP. So while uh, being participants in the workshop on animal spectroscopy for de drug development in the duration that all of you as participants are going to be here you will have opportunities to interact with my colleagues and see the laboratories in areas other than specific aim of these objectives and i'm sure neil and his students will be able to facilitate that so enjoy your stay here and uh, i'm actually happy we have amongst us today uh, Dr. Hosur and Dr. Jagannathan. They have actually traveled uh, specifically for being with you and they are the uh, veterans in uh, NMR uh, applications of variety of uh, kinds and uh, they have been pioneers in their own fields. So you would get benefit from their expertise and there will be many more also coming during the course of this uh, workshop. So take advantage of that and thank you for listening to me. Thank you for giving a nice overview of the workshop and ICGB. Uh, actually, Dr. Uh, Professor Rajesh Gokhale was supposed to be here, Secretary of Department of Biotechnology, but for some personal reason he could not make it and he has done very little services for the workshop. So, before we move, so there is a small change in the schedule accordingly, and we will have the first talk, this is Hasu's talk right now, and then we will have a tea and snacks, and then we have Jagannathan's talk. So, coming to the genesis, what we have thought, I thought, just give an overview of the thing, the, what, how they, this is a one slide which I had borrowed from Professor Ernst, and he explained how the knowledge actually moves around, it starts with the fundamentals in physics, goes on to the chemistry and the biology and finally you do see the application in medicine and agricultural sciences. And a 
according to me, the NMR is one land that which actually links everything together. And when he was presenting his talk at Amritsar, one of the students actually asked him, where is mathematics? So he had a slide to show that and so actually that is the root of everything. So mathematics is the root of everything. So finally you see it. So animal act was developed, start, means all those magnetic um, research was going on for a long time, but actual animal came into the picture in 1946 when Bloch and discovered this thing and they started with the permanent magnet and the, it's like a typical absorption spectroscopy for sweeping magnetic field and sweeping frequency either of them and things in then progress and this was the first signal of water and if you think of water something like 56 molar and this was the signal of that so it started from that time and then came an immense contribution from Professor Dramati who was working there and he poured water on the thought of some of the physicists when he observed three lines in each novel and these three lines were there because three different kind of hydrogen atoms present in ethanol. And so physicists were not happy because they were thinking the magnetic resonance, they can see one atom, one signal, one absorption. And this was, but finally that became the most useful application and that's why anyone else, we apply in chemistry and biological sciences it's just because of chemical shifts. And somebody has written that it may remain a certain chemical problem. So that's a different thing. So, and that's what we would describe how the chemical shift and it's the most important thing and then this may have remained a mere relatable complication for the physicist had not a chemist Ramati pointed out if the chemical shift were indeed real okay and he came back in 1953 and he started this animal research group at that time of fundamental research so this is way back in 1953 even just seven years after the animal was discovered the 30 megahertz spectrometer but it was an insensitive spectroscopy, and I say this 56 molar water giving this kind of signal. So people at times started labeling NMR as something like no more research. So NMR actually became a funny talk at time. But then came an ingenuity from Professor Richard Ernst in 1964, who applied the mathematical formulation developed by Joseph Fourier in the 17th century, and he actually managed with the current thing and developed the Fourier transformation. In my spectroscopy, which made the things very easy and very fast. The second biggest contribution came from Professor Anil Kumar, who discovered a phenomena called nosy, and which linked two atoms in space. So the advantage of that was that animal can measure distances between two atoms easily, and that became basis for determination of structures of biomolecules in solids. So this is what is described, so you have cross peaks which are from the two atoms which are close in space and they give rise to these peaks. So from that era, the world year one, uh, which uh, people used to call a snake face, NMR is hardly useful, it becomes NMR very useful. And as I saw the first slide of Ernst, it really became a real tool for the life saving and medicine when NMR, MRI was developed where you can see the volumes, different diagnoses, you see the prognosis, everything. <coughs> so into some of the images, great images which could be taken using MRI. Of course, nuclear world was dropped that time because some people might come, especially the patient might get afraid from nuclear, that's why it used to be called MRI. So uh, things have progressed so much that now you can do angiography with MRI easily and good things can be seen. It moved from the, that dimension to functional MRI, where we can really see which part of the brain reacts to a particular kind of function, disease, or mood, or any other kind of things. And this is now also developing. And that actually took it towards the more of a psychology or meditation. This is one image with Dr. Kusu had taken from the earlier. What is the effect of meditation on brain? So this is again done by MRI. FMR, functional MRI of plants, so one can do MRI without a plant, without making a solution or something. Just put it and you can really take the image of that. So now, in the today's world, what we see in NMR spectroscopy, where it started from the atomic resolution of molecules, it has traveled a long distance. Dynamics, drug discovery, quality control of wine and milk or any other product, or exploration, 
environmental discovery especially and this is here in NMI is not destructive unlike mass imaging and more recent explosive detection which prefer time especially in Russia the remotely detected explosives so in 1993 a famous thing came out that's what you could say they wrote actually magnetic resonance imaging is an irrefutable testimonial to the enormous value of basic research. So NMI started as a basic research and finally we do see the proofs in terms of magnetic resonance imaging. So that's what NMR involved and some of the contributors, major contributors, there are lots of them but in one slide I could pick on a few of them. So started from physics and then you see Block and first Lance, Gina, they took and then took them to chemistry and biology and Dr. Warren and Mansfield for the medicine. So what we have seen in the earlier in the 1940s, the NMR when you have the permanent magnets and very poor quality signal. The current days when you have the real state of the art NMR spectrometer with the material is good material research, nice magnets, nice electronics. And you can now measure even a signal of 3D, 3D protein spectra of a 50 micromolar protein. So this way, has traveled a long distance in the last something like 80 years. NMR and ICTV started in 2009, and 500 MHz with cryo facility, simultaneously shared facility with NIS 700 MHz. And it was inaugurated by Professor Kurt Utrich here, and you can see him speaking here. And we have upgraded also to the new latest electronic console, which can have multi receiver and you can measure multi nuclei at the same time. So, this is the way we have right now, and we will experience all of them here. We have experts from Google also coming here who will show you the latest for some of the sequences here also. So, with that, thank you. And so, we now directly move directly to the first lecture. First lecture is being given by Professor Ramakrishna Hasur. Ramakrishna Hasur uh, name actually is synonymous with the protein NMR or DNA NMR. So if you talk in something in India, and he was in the laboratory of Professor Kurt Guthrie and Professor Ernst that time when NMR was actually developed when the first protein structure came into the, the publication of principal being actually calculated that time and all the methods were developed that time. He did PhD with Professor Govil, uh, Doctor of Fundamental Research, and then he joined only and since then he has many uh, contributions in DNA. Some of the tetras came from his laboratory, you know, novel C tetra, A tetra, T tetra, and recent time major work has been on the unfolded protein, which are the real challenging one because you don't have any defined structures. And he developed new methodology in that. And off lately, he has moved to some of the metabolomics part and trying to see some of the small plant metabolites. And he named that field, actually, now that it become popular, he named that field as herbalomics. So you have herbal thing plant directly without separating, you can see what are different metabolites and it should be useful, like trifla and other things. So he has been that EFR later, he has been a director at the Center of, Center of Excellence in Basic Sciences and Initiative of the Department of Atomic Energy of Government of India. And they are now at IIT. So he had, there are many awards, but the one of the civilian, highest civilian honor means what here. He has been awarded Parmasri in 2014 or 15, I have some, some time that. So now I invite Professor Hansur to give a brief overview of how the NMR has traveled during the last few years and what are the new applications.
be here again at ICGEB for this NMR workshop. And ICGEB has taken a great initiative of organizing many different workshops as I heard from the director. And then workshops play a very important role in the development of science. The science continues to develop unless we are abreast with the latest developments. We will not be able to appreciate the research that happens at the different times. So therefore, this becomes an important ingredient of development. And I remember in many of these international conferences, there are special sessions kept for such purposes, tutorial sessions kept for in international conferences because these developments are happening so rapidly. All over the world, people cannot cope up with the things that are happening. Therefore, it becomes necessary to have this sort of a trend of workshops and it's a great thing that ICGB is organizing so many different workshops in different fields because the science as we know is developing in all directions and NMR is actually participating in all of those, so many of those, so much of interdisciplinary nature work. It started with physicists and Neil gave a wonderful uh, overview of the way it has developed. And had the good fortune of being associated through the journey of NMR from the days when uh, it was there initiated in TIFR, then in ETH Zurich, then in US and various places. So it has it has gone through a, a whole lot of development. What one could not imagine at one point in time became imaginable. Therefore, at certain time, Richard Ernst said, I remember. If we want to predict what is going to be the future of NMR, they said very dangerous to predict. So, and it continues to be so. No matter what you have done until now, never say this is the end of the road. So it continues to develop in various different fields as new technologies appear on the scene and we are incorporating all of those things into, uh, into, into research and development in NMR. So, in this sense, I chose this topic today for magnetic resonance in healthcare because the topic of this workshop is drug development, discoveries, biomarkers. Huh? Oh, I can see it from here. Mm. Can I, I go there now? So, I can see it better. Okay. So, this is the um, uh, chose this topic and uh, uh, briefly we will go through what uh, Neil already mentioned to you. The discoveries happened in the basic 1946 and whole range of um, concepts evolved with the chemical shifts, the coupling constants over Hauser effect, Fred echo. For the basic discovery a Nobel Prize in, was awarded in physics to Felix Bloch and E.M. Fussell. Of course prior to that there are also two, Nobel, two more Nobel Prizes in the area of uh, magnetic resonance, then NMR, nuclear discovery of nuclear magnetic moment and then the magnetic resonance in the gas phase. It was first was Otto Stern for magnetic moment discovery, then in the gas phase discovery that was Rabi and then the solution phase discovery happened in the 46 and that became actually the turning point for applications in various areas of chemistry, biology, medicine, psychology and forensic science and what not. So here we have uh, then of course there were other series of developments in the 1950s and the 60s, spin decoupling, cross polarization, they sent into the field of solid state NMR. Then one of the major revolutions was Fourier transform NMR as Neil already mentioned to you and this was an integration of mathematics into uh, NMR. This happened by accident, a kind of an accident in the sense that uh, Richard Ernst was actually working in Varian. Um, at, uh, in the 1960s as, as a postdoc after finishing his PhD from ETH Zurich and there they were working with radars and they used radio waves and uh, you know this uh, uh, therefore he was actually very impressed and he thought of this idea that why not we use Fourier transform NMR to overcome the problem of sensitivity which was uh, bothering the NMR spectroscopies. Then came another major development a two dimensional NMR then you have NMR imaging which is a parallel development for Lutterberg and these people and then of course it continues to develop as I said. Till date you have multidimensional NMR, 
you have this multiple receivers this is again the thing which has been introduced in the recent uh, years today in spectrometers earlier spectrometers you would have one receiver in the spectrometer but today no you have as many channels you have in channel you have a receiver for every channel so you can parallelly collect the data in all the different channels then your non uniform sampling developments which actually reduce the speed uh, increase the speed of data acquisition without losing the information then if you have 10 mr the improves the, resolu the resolution in the spectra uh, super sequences these are combination of different sequences to obtain many different kinds of nmr spectra in in the same in the same go so you see it has got so many more nobel prizes here 1991 nobel prize to richard nas in chemistry to 2002 nobel prize in chemistry again to kurtwitrick both in eth then physiology and medicine for rotterbor and peter mansfield and this went in a parallel direction so now no everybody knows mri is a is, is a buzzword everybody knows so without that you cannot do every hospital will have to have an mri machine so here is the here are the photographs of all of these people who are the pioneers and the contributors to the important developments that have happened and we don't know what's more going to come so never say okay we have reached the end there is a lot to do for that go further and further i sometimes ask ask this question to one of these uh, stalwarts malcolm levitt who was who was who discovered many of the super sequences asked him do you think we have reached or we are going to reach a stage when you are going to do nmr of a single single molecule or single spin they are still far away very very far away presumably but however you can never lose hope because you know you know the story of the gravitational wave so those of you who followed gravitational waves this was a prediction which was made by einstein 100 years ago 100 years ago there was he made that there should be gravitational waves however it was not possible to detect them because they were so weak what was required was to have increase the sensitivity by 10 to the power 20 so one in 10 to the power 20 you had to be able to disc to detect and that is what we are now so if we can do develop a kind of a strategy where we can reach that level of sensitivity is is incredible so it's going to we will we'll see so this is something which one has to wait and see okay now this is the mri chandrasekhar picture and jagannathan is going to talk about it in much more and this is gives you anatomical disorders with regard to the body without cutting the body you can actually see what's going on inside the body you can actually see in functional mri you can also see what's happening while you are doing something while you are moving your hand thinking of something and then what is happening inside your brain or inside your body a few pictures of those ones are here the imaging pictures okay this is the brain this is the breast cancer here so the whole body imaging here and then of course these are standard images which uh, some of you have I mean, already showed and jagannathan is going to talk about it more and more i am going to focus on the other aspect of uh, nmr applications which is leading to the molecular level discoveries these are molecular to biomolecular disorders so these are very small particles now see you are talking human body is a huge object of course you everybody can see it but these are molecules which you cannot see so you will have to infer the information from the spectroscopy what you get information in the spectroscopy you have to infer from there and understand about the molecular structures and how they contribute to different diseases and what we should do what sort of a molecules we should get to control these diseases so here we have the standard uh, thing here genome to metabolome you have the genome all of you know every cell has a dna and then of course constitutes the genome that expresses different kinds of proteins so it is converted from the genome let's say about 30000 typically are there then you get the transcriptome same any ones this is the in information it's transcribed into so called messenger rna and you have so many of those but then of course from these you produce the proteome which has more than 100000 proteins as a result of combination of different parts of this messenger rna you have so many different kinds of proteins and of course you also have post translation modifications and all of these are dealing with the metabolome with all the small molecules we are metabolites so they are what the food you eat and what you take it all gets converted into small molecules and these are the energy suppliers the processes are the energy suppliers and all of these are influenced by your environment the diet the age the lifestyle drugs and diseases and these ones will determine a phenotype in biological terms so therefore what is every individual is different we are slowly recognizing that every individual is different 
So he is now going from, of course, people had thought about it this, uh, thousands of years ago with regard to the personalized uh, treatments. So now that is now becoming in medicine as a personalized medicine. Every individual, one size doesn't fit all. So that sort of in, uh, recognition is coming now and we have to therefore go into that direction to see how that thing is happening and we have to be at the finer details of the uh, intricate play between these different kinds of molecules. So here you have the protein world, the proteomes perspective here, the protein is synthesized in what we call as the ribosome here. As it comes out of the ribosome, it is in a kind of an unfolded state. Then it may go into various kinds of fates. So it may degrade itself by various enzymes which are present here. They may be dis disordered aggregates there. Or it go into disordered aggregate without cutting themselves. Or it can go to a certain pathway and fold into a kind of a structure which is called the native state. Where it goes through different various intermediates. And these intermediates can associate themselves in a disordered manner or in an ordered manner. And these ones then lead to so-called amyloid fibrils. And these are actually also the source of diseases. Many of these things are the source of diseases here. The one which goes into the native state, so-called native state, these are kinetically driven phenomena. The native state is actually a kinetically driven phenomena. Ultimately, the most stable state is this. So typically, a native state is the one which is kinetically preferred uh, according to the pathway. And then this can actually go into a uh, oligomer and many in a research area are focused on these particular states because people thought that it is this one which is responsible for the function in biology. Indeed so, however, we now realize there are a whole lot of proteins which are called intrinsically unfolded proteins. Intrinsic, they are intrinsically unfolded, they don't have a regular structure, but they actually perform those, so many different functions. What do they do? They interact with the different partners. And when they do so, they adapt themselves to different structures and therefore they are able to do it. And a large number of proteins are now recognized to be intrinsically unfolded proteins. And even those proteins which are folded have domains which are intrinsically disordered. These are called as intrinsically disordered protein regions. So the IDPs and IDPRs. So both these things are important. And now, however, these are also difficult to study from many of these techniques. Because you need, these ones do not crystallize here and these have to be studied and NMR actually happens to be one of the ideal technique for studying these kind of systems. Okay, now here is an example of how a misfolded protein, an unfolded, pro, misfolded protein can lead to a disease. So you have your prion diseases, a, the normal protein is in this manner, which is a helical structure and then when it goes into a certain uh, transformation, you have the beta sheets here, this leads to a um, disease, prior disease, and this actually won the Nobel Prize in 1997 to Krishna. There are so many such diseases, okay. Now we can uh, see here the use of other kinds of techniques. When the molecule actually associates to form fibrils and things like that, then you have a huge uh, system getting formed here, and these ones cannot be studied by normal solution state NMR spectroscopy, and these ones have to be studied by what is called a solid state NMR. So these are small peptides, these are amyloid peptides, about 42 residues long, 40 to 42. And these ones actually aggregate or form kinds of fibrils and these are huge objects. Huge objects, as you can see here, these are images which can be taken from the transfer electron microscopy and cryo EMs and things like that. And you get a uh, structure of this type. And these are responsible for many of the neurodegenerative diseases, Parkinson's, Huntington's, Alzheimer's. All of these are coming because of this sort of formations. It is not obviously, it's not clear of course whether they are the aggregates which are responsible or the what happened, the oligomers which happen on the pathway to form this solid fibrous. Those are those which are the uh, damaging entities. So that research is, uh, therefore this is, I came across the recent, uh, this is Chris Dobson and others, they actually edited a book just somewhere in the 2010, about a decade ago a very big book on protein misfolding diseases. Therefore, now you will realize that how important protein folding is. Protein structure is one thing, but the protein folding phenomenon itself is another, another important thing. So, you can target the protein structure or the protein folding process itself to design drugs for, uh, uh, for different diseases. And here is the small molecules, the drugs, osmolites, can prevent the misfolding of proteins by stabilizing the native pore. This is how we get into studying the metabolome and the herbolome, as Nis mentioned, 
So these small molecules, the herbalome consists of small molecules which are produced by the plants. By and large, many of these conventional products are also isolated from many of the plant products. So therefore, a, a gross effect of the plant metabolome, how it will influence the diseases, and that is what I said is called as the herbalome. You treat with that. We will come to that uh, soon. Now, so as uh, how NMR has been able to contribute in all of these areas, uh, briefly I will mention this. Um, a development that happened in the two dimensions after the Fourier transform NMR, which uh, was the first revolution, this is the second revolution, the two dimensional NMR. The one dimensional NMR was not able to resolve all the peaks to be able to identify them as belonging to individual protons in your molecule or in your nuclei in the molecule. But the two dimensional NMR in spread this information in a plane so that you can get a two dimensional spectrum. The data collection has to be done appropriately in that manner that you have to have two time variables in this uh, two dimensional experiment. In the normal Fourier transform NMR, you have one time variable, you do a Fourier transformation, you get the frequency domain. Here you will have to have two time variables, therefore you need a two dimensional Fourier transformation to get the two dimensional frequency domain spectrum. We will not go into the theoretical details of those ones, but nevertheless you see a picture of this here, how does a two dimensional spectrum look like. So here you have a so called a diagonal here on this um, two dimensional plane. And these are actually contour plots. These are the intensities go in the third dimension. You have two frequency axes, the intensities go in the third dimension. But you take cross sections in various places and plot the contours, and therefore you get a contour plot of the two dimensional uh, the NMR spectrum. And you see here so much of information. All of these are the information here. These are the so called cross peaks here, all here. These are called cross peaks. These are the information carriers. These tell you which protons are correlated in some way. In this case, this tells you that this proton is correlated by a certain kind of an interaction which is called the dipole-dipole interaction, which is distance dependent. Therefore, the intensity of each of these peaks will depend on the distance between the two protons. Therefore, all of this information interactions are happening in the molecule, but now we express this in the form of a spectrum in a two-dimensional plane. So, now you quantify these various distances, uh, intensities of all these various peaks. And then you say, okay, this peak must correspond to a distance range of, let us say, 2.5 to 3.5 angstroms or 3.5 to 4.5 angstroms on the basis of the intensity of the peak. And those ones are called as distance restraints. First of all, you have to assign these individual resonances to individual protons, which is possible because of the combination of different kinds of techniques, which is one of them is nosy, other one is the two-dimensional correlated spectroscopy, which displays correlation because of the J coupling between the protons. And combining those two, you can obtain the resonance assignments of the individual peaks. Then you quantify the distances between, uh, quantify the distance between the protons by saying, okay, well, this distance must be between these two lower and upper bounds. Then you define a so called energy function that you have to build a model that the model should satisfy all of these distance constraints. Suppose you have a protein of 100 amino acid residues or 200 amino acid residues, you will have some 10,000 such kind of proton pairs. So all the distances you must have, you get them from your nosy spectrum and if you build a model which satisfies all of this, then of course you say the energy of that function of, of that thing is zero. Otherwise you have a so called NOE potential function which defines how much is the deviation of the distance in your model from the what it should be as per the constraints what you are given here. Then you actually optimize your molecule, optimize your geometry in the structure so that you ultimately reach this kind of a strength. So there are algorithms developed for this, there are various different kinds of algorithms, distant geometry algorithm is one of those, or strain molecular dynamics is another one. So there are different kinds of algorithms created. All this happened in the 19, uh, early 80s, okay. So this was happening in the Kurt uh, Wittrich's lab with regard to the distant geometry and strain molecular dynamics and, uh, and then of course you see here through the distant geometry what you get. You take a particular protein here, start from this particular model. This of course does not satisfy any of those constraints. Okay, you start with the four, five, six different initial models, which you do not satisfy your constraints, of course. Now you put the constraints and run the model, run the programs, distance geometry algorithm, so that you eventually reach a state which satisfies all the distance constraints which you have got from your from your NMR data. And you see, in every case, no matter where you start from, you come to the same sort of a structure which tells you that, okay, my constraint set is sufficient and good enough to be able to obtain a unique structure of the protein. Okay, well, that was using basically the proton-proton correlations. 
But Suri actually landed up in a difficulty that, well, the resolution in the spectra is not good enough to be able to identify each peak or to quantify each peak in your spectrum. Therefore, you turn to other uh, nuclei, the so-called heteronuclear experiments. Then heteronuclear experiments, you have the so-called, one of the most popular ones with regard to the proteins is the proton N15 HSQC spectrum. N15 is the nucleus and here you see only the correlations. You see the correlations, but you don't see diagonals here. You get spectra on one side you have the protons, other side you have the nitrogen 15. These are correlation spectra. So each peak represents one residue. Therefore, if there are 100 residues in your protein, you have 100 peaks. Therefore, since the spectrum is called as the fingerprint of the amino acid sequence of your protein. So if you have 200 amino acids, you should have 200 peaks. You can count these peaks. And fortunately, the N15 dispersion is really good, no matter whether the protein is folded or unfolded. So in either case, you can see, even though the proton dispersion may not be too high, you will see a good dispersion in this nitro 15 dimension. And that actually we will see, like we will exploit this little bit more as we go along further. So you can see every peak where it uh, can be identified and you uh, then go, go ahead with the quantification. Now we go one step further. Well, we had the proton-proton correlation spectra, the nosy spectra, which is of course very important from the structural point of view, because that tells you what is the structure of the molecule. Now we also have the heteronuclear correlation experiment, the HSQC, which tells you about the primary sequence of the molecule. Why not combine these two and generate a three-dimensional spectrum or a four-dimensional? You can also do with the carbon 13. You combine these two here. Here you have the proton-proton correlation, as in the nosy or the cosy or something. Then you have the proton N15 HSQC spectrum. Oops. Then you have the proton HSQC spectrum. Here you show, okay, typical, these are the schematic here. You have three peaks here. Let's say there are 10 peaks here. Obviously, these 10 peaks are not, you cannot identify them as belonging to one particular amino acid residue, but there are too many of those. Then when you see that, okay, you show an N15 correlation spectrum, then you see there are three N15, which means that this amide proton chemical ship, there are at least three amino acids, because there are three nitrogen chemical ships here. Now what you do is you pull this spectrum, this spectrum, along the third dimension as per the chemical shift of N15. Then you find, okay, there are three here, four here, and three there. That means all these 10 peaks were actually coming from a superposition of three amino acid residues contribution. Now, if you do that further, suppose there is a further ambiguity, then you can actually also use carbon-13 chemical shifts, then of course you produce this four-dimensional spectrum with using the carbon-13 dimension. However, when you want to do this, biology plays an important role. In what way? Because you have to enrich your proteins with nitrogen-15 and carbon-13. These are not naturally abundant. Nitrogen-15 is only 0.37% natural abundance. Carbon-13 is 1.1%. Therefore, how do you produce this? To, to be able to record the spectra, you must have all of those uniformly labeled with N15 or C13. And biology has become an important contributor here. Because you can grow your cells with N15 sources and nitrogen 15 uh, with ammonium chloride, N15 labeled ammonium chloride, or C13 labeled glucose, and the bugs will take away all of these and produce this and uh, put them in all the all the things which they will synthesize inside your cells. So E. coli cells is the most commonly ones used for this purpose and you get, you can also use other, other uh, systems for producing your proteins. Okay, so therefore now you have possibilities of doing nitrogen 15, carbon 13 and proton. So you combine these three further. Now when you combine these three, you generate a whole range of experiments called as triple resonance NMR experiments and this was actually pioneered by Advax at NIH and a whole range of experiments were developed here and this indicate uh, what do these ones I will illustrate with you only one example here this if you take the HNCA experiment the red ones are the ones which are the frequencies are appearing in the different sequence along the three different dimensions these are all three dimensional experiments on one dimension you have the amide protons here another dimension you have the nitrogens and the third dimension you have the C alphas and here you actually walk along the polypeptide chain along the backbone here making use of correlations between these um, uh, nuclei and these are based on one proton co uh, coupling constants uh, one bond coupling constants here and this is a two bond coupling constant and these ones do not vary too much from amino acid to amino acid therefore you can actually walk along the polypeptide chain without hindrance 
If the uh, assignment process also has to depend upon the structure where the coupling process will change, the distance will change, then you may get into some difficulties. This was what was happening earlier in the case of the nosies and the cozy based experiments. But when you do this here, there is no hindrance at all because all of one bond, two bond couplings, you can easily walk along the polypeptide chain. So here this correlates to neighboring amino acid residues. This is residue number i and this may be residue number i plus 1. So you get from residue number i plus 1 to correlation to residue number residue i. Therefore, you establish sequential correlations in this three-dimensional spectrum. So that will produce extremely good uh, resolution and a whole round of experiments have been designed to obtain the um, assignments of specific uh, nuclei, sometimes with the carbonyl, you obtain the carbonyl resonances and you uh, here you produce the directionality for the assignments and these also you can use for the side chains here, side chain along the betas, the beta carbons, etc. all you can use. Now we will, uh, these ones have been used and quite uh, ex ex extremely good spectra have been obtained. And this is the typical three dimensional spectra where you have N15 on one axis, C13 on one axis and the proton on the third axis. So you can take projections, projections will rep uh, represent the uh, correlations of two nuclei and in the three dimensional box you have the peaks with all the three correlations. Okay, as a result of all of these, now what is the progress that has been made? The progress that has been made here is in the early days when it was in the 1970s, 80s, you would hardly get one structure in one year or two years without a based on uh, homonuclear proton, proton experiments and as you went along the rapidity with which it has increased, see here the structure is getting determined very very rapidly because of the use of the heteronuclear experiments and this is the 2019 data, typically in the protein data bank you have about these many protein structures deposited in the protein data bank. Of course, this is only the proteins, of course this is continuing to grow, okay. The ambition was to determine the structures of all the proteins inside a gel, so that was uh, inside a cell. Okay, so that was the ambition, therefore a whole lot of investments were made, dozens and dozens of spectrometers were uh, um, uh, installed and all fields, not only 600, 500, 700, 800, 900, today we also have 1.2 gigahertz NMR spectrometers installed at a couple of places. Of course, these are very expensive instruments and we will have to design strategies as to how to make use of these, how to make use of the instruments by certain kinds of collaborations and need to have a quite of an understanding with various funding agencies for this purpose. Now, the functional perspective, that was the structural perspective. Now, the functional perspective is you have this native state and you have the so-called other state here. You have the molten globule state, the denatured state and the pre-molten globule state and all of these interact with the native state, okay. And then you have the protein folding here. If the native denatured state is here, which I also showed you in the case of the Dobson's um, um, picture we showed there. And you have these, all these states are very rapidly exchanging with each other. Multiple conformations are present here. There, and then because the native state is only one particular structure or a few structures, a small domain. How does the protein reach from here to here? Various pathways which are present. And if the pathway, something can go wrong, protein will get misfolded. So you have to address all of these issues. You start from the unfolded protein here, which is what comes out from the ribosome and it is synthesized. And when it reaches here, can it go through different kinds of pathways and then it can get misfolded and then you try to understand all of those. Therefore, you need to understand the whole pathway here. So therefore, that is the protein folding problem. Understand the protein folding pathways. And then you have the another aspect which is responsible for biological function and that is the dynamics. Here is the classic example here. So this is the protease, HIV protease. HIV protease is a dimer and it is a covered one here. Then there is an active site here, the substrate has to come in here and it gets cleaved and then it throws out. And this happens because of the dynamics of these loops which are present in the dimer here. So this dimer, this dynamics is contributing to biological function, not just the, not just the structure alone. The structure and the dynamics are important for biological function. Therefore, and this is in the domain of NMR. Determining the protein structure, protein dynamics is this exclusively in the domain of NMR and interactions as a result of that it comes out. Now, I mentioned to you about intrinsically disordered proteins or the unfolded proteins. Now, the unfolded proteins are difficult to handle as well. Why? Because of this problem as I mentioned. See, here you see this is a folded protein, HIV, HIV protease folded protein and here is an unfolded protein. The dispersion along the N15, uh, the proton dimension is much smaller compared to what is present here. 
Therefore, this NHS uses pattern. You may not be able to count all the peaks if you have uh, the resolution is not good enough. But good enough, well, fortunate so that you have the nitrogen 15 dispersion is very good. One can make use of this nitrogen 15 dispersion to develop different techniques for obtaining better dispersions. Now, this was the develop development which took place. A lot of people had worked, uh, tried to do this, and uh, uh, the ideas were uh, various people tried to do it. And the idea is like this that you have the N15 dispersion along uh, N15 along two axes and proton on one axis here. Okay, and we entered into this area sometime in the in the 2000 area and uh, developed a few of, of these applications here to or what we call as a NH and CN plus sequences that contributed to enhancement of the information content and also provided various kinds of checkpoints in your uh, sequential resonance assignment procedure. And then this, this is another idea of the dual receivers. In one of these, the idea is the following that you have why you have only one receiver? You, when you pass through the various kinds of pulse sequences, you transfer the magnetization from one nucleus to another nucleus and so on and so forth. At some stages, you actually have to make a selection of the magnetization components and in the process of the selection, you throw away certain magnetization components as well. Now, that information can be used provided you have another receiver. So, this was one of the ideas which we had that we produced, all right, let us look at carbon-13 signal at this point. Without disturbing the progress of the sequence here, you introduce the carbon 13 receiver here. Okay, fine. So, when you did this, so in this particular experiment, when you do it, you have the T1, which is the nitrogen 15 here, and the T2 prime, which is the um, uh, carbon here, and this T2, this continues to be the nitrogen, and then you have the T3 here, which is the proton. So, therefore, you have in this, you get two experiments in one go. So, you have the proton here, the nitrogen here and the nitrogen there, the three dimensional experiment. Then you get a two dimensional experiment because you collected the data here and then this was responsible for the uh, T2 prime and T1. From this you get a two dimensional spectrum. On one axis you have the C alpha, other axis you have the nitrogen 15. So, you get nitrogen 15 carbon correlation. In this case you get in the top one, you get proton nitrogen 15, nitrogen 15 correlations. Okay, you can continue this further, walk along the polypeptide chain, making use of receivers at various places and uh, this actually I guess I see Jitendra Reddy's name in the, in the list. So, he is going to talk about it and so this was the development which actually you can, in one experiment, you can get the entire polypeptide, all the backbone, everything in the backbone you can obtain the assignment. You actually get two three dimensional experiments in one go. So, this is the 3D HACANH. Here are the 3D HACSEO. What it produces you is the alpha of H alpha of I, NH of I and I plus 1, nitrogen of I and I plus 1, C alpha of I and carbonyl of I. All of these are obtained from one data acquisition which produces two three dimensional experiments. Okay. Well, this is the summary of all those various kinds of developments which, which happened. Uh, the combination by and large you have two nitrogen axis in all of these and one proton axis. You can also go to the four dimensions there and then combine that with the reduced dimensionality concept. We are not going to go into the details of those pulse sequences here, but this produces a in information enhancement in the different experimental sequences. Well then, this is fine and of course, as a result of this, what was taking earlier one year, now you get it in few days. So, we were able to obtain the sequential assignments in various kinds of uh, proteins, folded proteins, unfolded proteins and things like that. And the, one of the important thing is look here, the 5 megadalton size protein, one could identify the pathway as to how the protein self associates itself to produce such a huge assembly. And this was possible because you could do a denaturing of and then for the self association and identify the uh, structure of this associate, the pathway of the association. Okay, now I want to show a little bit more about this uh, folding pathway here and this is uh, Ashutosh Kumar actually he is also he is also giving a talk, he is now going to talk about the solid state NMR. He entered into the solid state NMR aspects there and you start with the denatured state and that belongs here, okay on the top and then you come down here. So, this is the folded state, pass through this process here, slowly then you are going, going down the funnel here, going down the funnel, there are various kinds of barriers. What changes occur in the NMR spectra? 
and these ones will tell you how the protein is folding. Okay, so uh, cutting the long story short, so I'll show you here. This is a completely unfolded state, and as you start folding it, as it starts going down the funnel here, it starts getting some structures at some places, and some regular structures are getting formed. Initially, it is a slowing down of the motions, and then you start getting structures formed and more structures formed. Then actually, you see now some structures are getting dislodged. So some are right, and then everything is dislodged here. Then for new structures, okay. Then finally it folds here. So what is the process? What do you conclude from here? What we conclude is when the protein starts to fold, it is driven by kinetic processes. Whatever is the pathway which is the easiest to go, it will go there. But there is not necessarily the most native form. It's not necessarily the most native form. So it goes there, and those structures which are formed will have to be removed when it has to go into the native structure. This is what happens here. So when it comes here, it is in a stage that it is exchanging very rapidly with multiple conformations, and these red ones are the one indicators of where these structures are getting interconverting. And the, therefore, we said here that the structure doesn't form by monotonously changing native contacts. Non-native contacts are made; these non-native contacts are removed, and it goes to a stage of exchange here, and eventually it forms a structure which has all these beta sheets and the two helices which are there in the final structure. Okay. Now, having developed these various kinds of methods, you also develop automatic backbone assignment protocols because you want to increase the speed. You cannot be waiting for two years for one structure determination. I said, okay, you can do it in two days. So you automatically you can do it. The processes are simple, and then you have a standard process here. What uh, was done was you take a whole range of pro, um, uh, um, B B N M R B data which are there deposited in the B N M R B and develop an automatic um, uh, assignment protocol. Okay, this is because you have the N15 and the proton in the spectra in your H and H and C and series of spectra, and you have the checkpoints at various places. You feed that and develop a protocol to obtain automatic assignment. And this is the result here. Automatic auto by 3D gives you almost 100% success in the assignment protocol. Okay, so this is. In fact, I was trying to get this into the spectrometer uh, uh, uploaded. So one of these Brooker spectrum engineers who actually came and said, "Okay, we will do it," and he took that. Unfortunately, he died. So that is, and then of course it stopped there. But some other Brooker engineer is going to take it up. That will that will happen probably sometime in the future. Okay. Ah, sorry. <laughs> he got an heart attack. So what is Moscow? Moscow. So as a result, this is the summary of all of those what I mentioned to you that you can actually get the this is the using all of these you get the structure in two days. So compared to years, you see now we come to two days. Let's see, we we'll go even further. Okay. Now you have the chemical shifts now. There are all protocols developed on the basis of the chemical shifts alone. You can actually calculate the structure, and those were developed by Rosetta. This is developed by um, at at, at Max Lab, and you can use these algorithms. To calculate the structure on the basis of the assignments which you get from the previous uh, slide, which I showed you, and the structures are pretty good. Ubiquitin, you test it, and where the structure is very well there, and you see the RMSCs are extremely small compared to the um, uh, crystal structures. And similarly, here for this protein as well, the structure determination has been very, very, very successful. Okay, now we want to do better. Two days is still too long. If you want to determine 100,000 proteins, the two days is still long. So you need to get it better. How can how can we improve the speed of the data acquisition? Here you make use of the non-uniform sampling. Uniform sampling means you collect all the data, all the T1 points here and things like that. In the non-uniform sampling, you collect only a few of those data points. You don't collect everything that is present here. However, you simulate all of them afterwards using certain protocols. You extrapolate that information, generate all the data points, and then you collect the uh, uh, process it using that method. Then you see what you get. In this experiment, it took 15 hours. This experiment took one and a half hours. No information lost. You have the same connectivity is present in your and our spectrum. Okay. So therefore, assignment is possible. Now this was tested on an intrinsically disordered protein, alpha synuclein, which has the poor resolution. This is an intrinsically disordered protein, and in that also you can see such a beautiful um, uh, uh, peaks, and you can obtain the assignments. Okay. Now, even better, you collect in two hours three 3D experiments. 
data for three 3D experiments. One is best HNM, then you have the best HNCO, CA, CB. I mentioned all of these things in a list which I give you earlier. You collect this in 28 minutes. And best HNCO, and here you get, of course, with the NUS, all of this, 22 minutes. All this put together, you collect only two hours. In two hours, you collect a whole lot of data. This is enough for you to obtain complete backbone assignment using those using those methods. Of course, it has to go through the HNM protocols, all of those. And that is possible. Okay. Now, that is so much for the protein structure determination, rapidity, increase in the speed of things like that. Now, I switch gears. Now, we are going to a prop which I told you earlier that we need to be handling various kinds of diseases, especially extra of the biomarkers, the drug development here, drug discoveries, biosimilars, what you get here. In this case, you will have to combine the metabolome with the, of, of the animals, animal world with that of the plant world and this is what I call as herbalomics. You have the, in either cases, you have the genome, the transcriptome, the proteome and the metabolome and then you combine these from here to here and that is what makes you herbalomics. Okay, so therefore what is it that you can do here and we target here intrinsically disordered proteins as well as structured proteins. As I mentioned in the previous one of those slides, small molecules like drugs or spolides can prevent the misfolding of proteins by stabilizing the native fold. Okay, so some indications are given here. What are these various kinds of things? This is the review which you wrote recently. Alpha Zeniclin responsible for Parkinson's disease, P53 for cancer here, insulin and tubulin for cancer, then also insulin for type 2 diabetes and all of these are intrinsically disordered proteins. And these ones when they go here and their protein disorder that happens and that lead to diseases. Now you can target these ones to prevent formation of these ones here. Okay, targeting conformational transition from unstructured to structured proteins, targeting IDPs or IDPRs, interaction network, and then you are targeting protein self-association, targeting IDP, IDPRs, interaction in pathogens. So these are small molecules now. So small molecules may work in isolation or they may work in synergy. They are working together and these are the herbal products. Herbal products, they generally contain large number of molecules and how do they act? Do they work in isolation or do they work in synergy? So if they work in synergy, you have to identify the synergy. Because of the synergy, many times you don't have side effects of these herbal products. Okay? And they are able to perform many different functions. They are able to be cure, curing many different diseases. I will show you this example with one of those, Trifala. Trifala is actually a mixture of three fruits. Um, is, a, is a formulation which is made and this one actually uh, inhibits Trifola is the one which inhibits alpha synuclein fibrilization uh, and, and this and we see how this inhibits the fibrillation process you see here these are the alpha synuclein fibrin this is a TEM image alpha synuclein fibrils here and then you with the Trifola 0.5 mg per ml you have this no fibrils form the TEM doesn't have show any of this fibril formation at all and then you will cut the NMR there, the NMR, see in the case of uh, this um, alpha synuclein, the red peaks are those which are in the absence of Trifala and you see some of those, uh, some peaks are missing here, several peaks are missing here, okay. And what happens, why do they miss, why are they missing? And the moment you put Trifala, you not only get these ones, of course, you also get these peaks coming back and this is the process of exchange, okay. So there is an oligomer exchange happening in the process of association. And that is prevented by oligomer formation is prevented by Trifala. So it stabilizes the monomer there and therefore you get these peaks back in your HSQC spectra. Okay, so this provides a mechanism as to how these ones are interacting. Now look at these residues which are there. These are all threonines and serines. Threonines and serines, these ones have an OH group in the side chain. Okay, and Trifala contains lots of polyphenols and many of those Components inside there. All you look at the analysis of all of these triple components. They contain polyphenols, and the polyphenols are hydroxyl groups, and therefore they interfere with these uh, residues, which are presumably playing a role in the, the in the association process and exchange going on there. And they interfere with that, and therefore you start getting a monomer and a stabilized monomer, and you get a very nice NMR spectrum. So, so this provides a mechanistic insight. NMR provides a mechanistic insight. Therefore, now you can see if you want to do something, then you can target your molecules to the threonines or the or, or the serines and things like that. You can synthesize the molecule which will go there and interact with those particular proteins segments. Now, some of those components we actually explored further. 
some of those components which are the pyrogalol, protelagen and tribulagenic acid. You can see the effects of those. This is the so called THT fluorescence which is actually a, a standard um, uh, say for fibrin formation. In the alpha centrally, if this fluorescence goes up here as the fibrin is getting formed, uh, when uh, th is the th fluorescence. Okay, this is alpha centrally. As it aggregates, the th fluorescence goes up. And when you are putting these different compounds, you see that fluorescence comes down differently to different with the different ones. And in this particular case, almost zero. Complete tribulagic acid produces almost zero. And this is a component of triphala. This is also the components of triphala, except paragalol. These are components of triphala. Of course, these three molecules, they are also if, are playing roles in cancer. This is Parkinson's all right. But they also play a role in cancer. They are also used for cancer treatment, therapy. Uh, therefore, you can see here, as I said, different products, components of a herbal product can participate in different kinds of patients. And there is a synergy between them. And because of that synergy, you don't have the side effects which are generally there with one particular kind of the compound used in the allopathic treatment. And that is why you are now getting into slowly what is called as personalized medicine and synergistic treatment of combinations of, as a combination therapy. You are not that is becoming a popular thing to do. And you see here the HSQC spectra of those overlapping ones. These are the temperatures of those. And you have the fibrils, alpha synuclein fibrils with pyrogalol, with uh, cholagen and tubulagic acid. This is the most effective. This is also what we saw from the THT fluorescence there, and it produced an extremely good uh, prevented the fibrillation process quite substantially. Okay, so this is the detail of those. Further, as to what sort of region of the protein is involved. So you see here in this region, this is quite quite substantially getting affected here in this particular in this pyrogalol, and this one is even more with the corallagin here. And you see this quite dramatic effects are happening with the chevalagic acid. This happens with the NAC region here, these are the N terminal. Earlier people thought it was only the NAC region which is responsible, but however, we now discover that it is not only the NAC region of the protein, but also the N terminal which is important for the aggregation process. And the trionine residues, which I mentioned to you earlier, they are present all over. Therefore, this is consistent with that kind of an image what we have got from the kernel. Now we look what happens with trifala, with cancer cells. The cancer cells, so this is the cancer there in the present uh, effect of cancer of uh, trifala in cancer cells. This is the control, cancer cell proliferation, trifala 25 micrograms per ml, trifala 50 prime micrograms per ml, 75, 100 microgram. And this is the standard which is used as a, as a chemo uh, drug. Okay. Now you see this is, we are able to get this trifala. The same trifala preparation which was used for, for the Parkinson's the fibrillation process same preparation which is actually now affecting the cancer cell proliferation as well. Okay, now we make gold nanoparticles. Attach this trifolar components to the gold nanoparticles. You see this is the reason which is important here. This contains the aromatic ones. The aromatic ones are actually participating when the attaching to the gold nanoparticles. Gold nanoparticles go and target the cancer cells. Okay, and therefore you attach these molecules over there. And they will go and target this. Um, uh, this is the collaboration with Manu Lopez, who is a faculty in, in Center for Excellence in Basic Sciences. And um, Sanjan is also a faculty in Center for Excellence in Basic Sciences. And Kavita was a postdoc at the same place. And now you see here interacting. This will completely disappear. Brought it out. So that is, the nanoparticles are interacting with trifolar components. And they are using these components here, the aromatic regions here, the polyphenols. And, and therefore, now we understand that these trifolar components go and interact with the microtubules inside the cancer cell. They prevent the assembly of the microtubules. And that is how cancer cells are not able to proliferate. Okay, that is the picture which is shown here. This is the control here. And you see with the micro mitochondrial dysfunction here, when gold nanoparticles impair cancer cell survival through induction of mitochondrial dysfunction. Okay. So that is uh, with regard to the trifala. Now we take up another one here, ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is another uh, herbal product. And this you see, it contains polyphenols. Ashwagandha polyphenol functionalized gold nanoparticles. Look at this. This is ashwagandha alone. And you attach that with the, uh, the gold nanoparticles. The NMR spectrum is completely vanished. So every portion of ashwagandha, every component of ashwagandha is interacting with the gold nanoparticles. And look at the effect of that here with regard to the um, uh, 
cancer proliferation. See, this, this is the taxol, this is the standard uh, chemo drug, and you see here with this, you have got complete abrogation of the cancer cell proliferation. So, these products are able to achieve that sort of a thing. Now, the mechanism you have to identify, the quantitation you have to do, and what are the components which are present, how the synergy is happening between the different components, because it is the same preparation which is actually affecting different kinds of uh, diseases, and therefore the side effects are going to be less if you administer those ones in your system when you are actually taking the treatment. Okay, now, well, for many of these things, you actually require the assignments with regard to industrial applications or development of biostimulus you need to do much more rapidly. You get thousands of samples, thousands of samples which come from various different sources. You need to figure out whether it is the same as the original and what we have or it is different. Or does it have the same components? Is How do we do it? And this requires artificial intelligence and machine learning languages. And this we can do by uh, a, a statistical uh, method which is called as Mahalanobas distance correlation. It developed a protocol here that even without having to actually do the assignment, without actually doing the assignment, you can compare the spectra and estimate the sample um, uh, behavior, what is the distribution of the peaks, what are the standard deviations there and how to calculate the similarities of the individual spectra. So you can do it in one go. So therefore, rapid comparison and a single parameter estimation of similarity of NMR spectra. So you can, um, this is applicable for biosimilars. Monitoring post-treatment recovery as a function of time, estimating and comparison of treatments with the different drugs, detection of adulterants in formulations. This is typically the typical problem. Honey, for example, honey is one which contains a lot of adulterants. Various kinds of syrups are being added there, and how are they there? And therefore, you can compare different kinds of honeys from various sources, and you can just develop a protocol. And with this one particular parameter, you can say whether it is good or bad. Is it original or is adulterated? I show you here an application with regard to the monitoring as a function of time, alpha synuclein fibrillation as a function of time. So this is 0 over the parameter correlation, we are going to the details of the theory of that one. So I will show here that okay, in the presence of uh, um, uh, uh, normal protein, of course the correlation is 1. As the fibrillation starts, this correlation becomes smaller and smaller, this parameter, you see this is the parameter which is which is given here. So how it becomes? And at the same time, look at the spectra. As the fibrillation is happening, peaks are disappearing there. Okay. Now you don't need to make an assignment to all of these. You superimpose all of these into this one and estimate the correlation of this. How this one is different with regard to the distribution of the peaks? It's estimate the correlations of these ones here with the single parameter called as the Mahler-Navas distance. Okay. And that comes out to be R squared 0.341. Now what you do? You use a drug. The drug is safranol. The safranol is able to inhibit alpha synuclein fibrillation. You do the same protocol. This is the same one here. So now you see the spectra doesn't change very much. And you have the uh, presence of safranol. So the spectrum is like this, and this is the kind of correlation you get 0.89. Earlier it was 0.34. So now we got a 0.89. Now, by looking at this parameter, we can tell whether how much is the change in your spectrum from various sources, whether it is the disease control or it is a comparison of molecules from various different sources, the tea samples or honey samples or drug samples from various sources which you are getting, how similar they are. You can use this parameter for, because if you want to do assignment, this is going to be a huge task, huge task, it's taking quite a long time. So, you can do this without having to do that. And this is the protocol which has to be implemented with various pharmaceutical companies and this is, uh, uh, companies can take up this kind of protocols. Okay, so I think with that I come to an end. I hope I have uh, stuck to the time. It is a, and there are a lot of, lot of people who have worked on these ones. I have listed here, several of the students are there and many of them are participating here and um, uh, the recent one, latest ones which are there, which I talked about are, are the work of uh, um, uh, Veer Mohan. He is the, he is a, uh, is a, was a postdoc uh, with me at CBS. Now he is moved over to Hyderabad with an independent position. He has, uh, he is the one who developed this artificial intelligence methods protocols with the machine learning to develop this Mahalanobis distance uh, correlation experiments. So, and then of course various biologists who have contributed in different aspects of uh,
protein preparation, cloning, things like that. So, and then I show you here, these people, Virmohan, this is Kavita Anushri, she is a biologist, Vaibhav Kumar Shukla, he is a um, protein NMR person, so he um, did quite a lot of work with the protein structure and dynamics. Shinjan, she has been involved with uh, all these uh, alpha synuclein fibrillation process. And Sunita, she is the one who is uh, computationally active, computational biology. And Mandar, he is one of the last students, he is the last student of mine. And uh, he worked on the alpha and the uh, fibrilla components with regard to alpha nuclear fibrillation. And the individual components are there to look at the synergy of those ones there. So, with that, I think I will stop. Thank the various NMR centers here. NMR experiments are carried out to various places, not only at I, not only at KFR, but also at um, NMR center IICT Hyderabad, IIT Bombay, uh, Department of Chemistry IIT Bombay, Temp facility IIT Bombay, and this is the NMR facility at TIFR. So with that, I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving a nice overview, including from starting from the protein and to how the different drugs, especially the, the formulation, what we call botanical drugs, herb, herbal drugs, Ayurvedic formulations, and how they act at the traditional medicines, especially. So, nevertheless, it's a preliminary talk, but we are open to the questions. So, invite questions, breaks, and it's a workshop, so it has to be interactive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, great talk actually. Okay, just uh, to curious to know that, so you said that uh, a number of serine and theonines are present and the uh, herbal compounds also, uh, the polyhydric compound. So those, these serine theonines are clustered in one particular region or they have distributed? No, they are, they are distributed. I, I give the numbers also, there are residue numbers also there. I see. Okay. They are distributed and they correspond to this uh, N terminal and the NAC region, they are present in both. And that is consistent picture there, therefore they both are contributing to the fibrillation process. And uh, your NMR data suggests that uh, those compound, herbal compounds specifically interacting with those, uh, with serine, those. With yes. serine and theonine residues? Okay. Presumably, because yeah. that is how it has interfered and then of course it has stopped the fibrillation process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? One should do that. Yes, yes, one should do that. And that is actually, that is our future course of action. Yeah. Uh, we have done uh, Ashwagandha already on ah, ah. As, uh, how it responds to that in an animal model. Okay. So okay. now you can uh, develop uh, a tumor model, whatever the way that you want to do it. Okay. And then okay, okay. do that. Yeah, yeah. Either you can use uh, the AIMS animal imaging experiment or ah. uh, the one at uh, Kochi. Okay, okay. Amrita, yeah. Which is uh, perhaps nearer to yeah, that's good. So that is. Yeah, yeah. So it goes to the uh, end, the clinical, the clinical portion. Yeah. Any other? Or participants? Anything? So, uh, so the idea behind uh, putting with gold nanoparticle is to cross the um, tight junction in... I think they target. They target. They target. They target the specific sites with the gold nanoparticles. That is known. Gold mm -hmm. nanoparticles target specific regions. That is known. Okay. But now you attach. You attach these drugs to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, on attachment, uh, yeah. the polyphenolic compound yeah. does not occlude like uh, the... Because you showed that the phenolic group interacts with a serine theonine or yeah, or yeah. A, no that was in cancer right so so what how does it modify the functional group in the um, in the herbal products no what we what we have, what we could always see is that they are interacting they are becoming bound there and therefore the signals are disappearing mm. okay. so therefore what it means is that the gold nanoparticles is tagged with these molecules and then they are going inside. So when they target at a particular place, now then we have to see how they will interact with those particular systems. Now, in, in, without the gold nanoparticles, when we did this experiment, with regard to the triple for example, they went ahead and interfered with the microtubule assembly. They disturbed the secondary structure of the microtubule. So that presumably they will do the same. Yeah. 
Oh, this is Pushkar. Yeah, yeah, I... Uh, did you compare the trifolite experiments with the known drugs after all and we saw the chemical shifts uh, for those polyphenols? Efficacy is... Yeah, yeah. No, for those series and three names, you found similar changes. When you, uh -huh. when you use the drug. Yeah, yeah. No, with the sephronol, with the sephronol, we did not go to the assignment. Okay. We did not go to the assignment. We use the sephronol thing for the development of this statistical correlation protocol. We saw that the THD fluorescence is coming, it is inhibiting the fibril uh, so formation. That would be indicated the mode of action of the two. Of the sephronol, yes. Sure. I mean, that with every drug that has to be done. With the other three things we saw, <coughs> I, I keep saying, okay, this is a gold mine. So there is so much, so much you can do. And India is very rich in it. Therefore, uh, we have all the reason to go more and more into it and explore it more so that others can follow. Yeah. Okay, sir, you talk about that uniform and non-uniform experiment. Yeah, sampling. Where you said that uh, because we have to concise over time so we can go with the non-uniform thing. Yes, yes. So my question is that how valid that thing is? Like, like if you are decreasing the time, right? Because the right. concern is that we can do that experiment in a limited period of time, like yes. in less time. Correct. Correct. So how valid it is? Because ultimately, ultimately it is the spectrum that determines whether it is valid or not. Okay. See, if you get the same spectrum, mm -hmm. it's valid. In the same amount of time, in a much less amount of time, then it is valid. It is the spectrum. The spectrum is the determining factor. Okay. And uh, this you have to demonstrate first that. What is the kind of a protocol you are, when you do non-inform sampling, whether you should do with the 10% data collection or 25% or 30%, 40%, you have to optimize this. So whether the spectrum is unaltered and you save the time. So that you have to evaluate. Once you do that, then of course it is, uh, of course in the optimization process you will have to spend some time. After that you can use it routinely. But the processing is not standard processing. The processing also requires certain other strategies. These protocols also have been developed. Okay. So there are no more. I thank Professor Hasud uh, for a nice giving of talk and overview. I will request Dr. Puska Sadma, Director NII to give this momento. And since Professor Hasu is kind of associated with NIA right now, so, so it will be a right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm meeting Professor Hasu. I've seen him after almost 30 years. In the last time was, of course, virtual. Virtual. <laughs> virtual. And then I went to do NMR experiments in a, from Kishnog after that of facing this was politically incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm bringing it up because I'm so impressed at 2 o'clock in the night or something he would be strolling and I think it was Anoop and uh, Rana at the time and he would be working. Uh, this thing was uh, mind-boggling for me. I'm not picking it up really. I mean, you know it, right? 2 o'clock, 2 o'clock, the tea time, you know, hey. The regular thing for him. And he would not, he would not, if I'm correct, if not go for dinner, it will be his student dinner. I wish we were that good. <laughs> no, I, I remember one incident, HNN, when we were developing, it was a monsoon time and we had got a first signal. And I being a pure nocturnal, pure nocturnal. So, with 2.30 or something, we got a signal and I called him at the home and it was raining. Bombay, it was raining, everybody knows. And it, so, it was something like this rain and we came at 2.30 in the night in the Enver Hospital to do, to see the signal. So, and that <laughs> Thank you. Most of the things come only in the night. Yeah, even the first Noji I heard earlier wrote that. Noji. Noji also the localization I developed in the University of Arkansas, Little Rock Medical School. Uh, localized spectroscopy. I will give you an in vivo some example. From a tumor, you can get the spectrum instead of the whole thing. So that came around 115 in the early morning. Okay. 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 So I met Professor Jagannathan when he joined as a young faculty at Dana faculty at Ames 
and this was when the new Richard Ernst was inaugurating the, uh, the MRI facility. And I'll tell you uh, what happened was I had collected some uh, you know, small peptide and MRI, and I was a naive young student in TPC lab, Anil Kumar. So he said, uh, and then after this reception, they were under under the tree we were standing in the reception and Richard Hans was there and you know, Nobel Laureate and stuff, you know. So he said, he called me, Anil Kumar, Professor Anil Kumar called me. You know, this guy, he's been, he's been that, you know, he saw, I mean, you know, I forgot one man, I'm positive and he's, so for this five, five more peptide, Richard Hans said, how is it possible? Go and get your spectra, luckily I had the spectra. So he started looking at the spectra, right? They forgot all tea and everything, it was amazing, you know, I mean, I get goosebumps when I see these geniuses sitting, standing there. This is what it is and so on. Then it started waiting. So we were uh, drizzling and we moved under a tree. I still had those, uh, I'm, tr I'm trying to make it sound poetic, those droplets of, uh, of, of water on the, on the Gautama had collected that, there's a, on this precious this thing, I had to get another this thing on that. But that, that is life. And so they said, yeah, that's true. But then Anil Kumar said, don't shoot it down. If, if he publishes, I have ever shot down anything from you, and so this is the kind of conversation. I mean, you know, I, I felt extremely blessed at that time. It was the kind of conversation uh, that took place, and you know, and it was amazing. Thank you. <laughs> and he was so humble. There is a humility of the man. <laughs> it's great to see. And seeing from you, evolving from the X-ray, and MRI now to a person who is well known for plasmodium research, and that team, that yeah, so that. Thank you, sir. So thank you. So we'll break for a tea and we'll assemble around 11.15 for another exciting domain where actually the clinical part and you know, Professor Jagannathan is one who really pioneered the MRI work in India. Most of the MRI actually in India started from his lab, right? <laughs> so we break for tea and we wait like around 11.15 again. So we are going
is a part where we really, most of us have encountered with us ourselves, our family members, MRIs, and this started, the technique started with the image of water, that's the first thing which was done. And in India, if you think of where the MRI has started actually, it starts the probably the origin will go to Professor Jagnathan, who after his instinct at British Columbia, Colorado, and who are in other places, many other places, he came back to India, although his journey started in Madras, and he came back to India and he joined made a permanent position and a full faculty position at all the Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, which was the birthplace means for the starting the MRI and other related work. And he worked immensely there and his, some of his seminal work includes the work on prostate cancer, breast cancer, these are which have direct clinical implication in most of the clinicians and aims in other places, they use it routinely. He also worked on a basic uh, biology of the sleep and other things. One of the key features which he had worked was during the breast cancer, the response or drug response and other things, where he imaged the tissues and also simultaneously looked at the spectroscopy part, imaging the metabolites in that particular voxel. So this actually helped the clinician to say which drugs are respond responding or not responding. And it's such an experience. He, he was later in the government of India task force. He is heading that. So where it is like making India ambition to make first MRI making India. Where multi-institutional network is there, including our neighboring IUAC. It's a part which is given responsibility to develop magnet and all the work integration and key designs actually for the Nathan is looking after. So hopefully like CT, the Make in India CT already there and has come up, hopefully soon we will have Make in India MRI lens. That is the for this concept we have Art Labor Bharat. So with all these words and a towering figure in this field, I invite Professor Jaganathan to deliver this talk. Thanks, Neil. Uh, it's a pleasure always to be here and especially at the invitation of uh, Neil. And uh, thank you very much and also thank uh, Dinkar for giving this opportunity. Uh, I just before I begin my talk, I have switched off. Uh, I wanted to know the basic background of you people you have heard of MRI earlier, uh, know the basic principles because I am not covering it. If, uh, you want me that, I can uh, spend about 10 minutes uh, just to give you a flavor of how the MRI, same basic principle, little bit ab about that one, okay. Uh, being a workshop, it doesn't really matter, so uh, I have a cup of water so I can go for two hours, no problem. Actually, this is uh, the slide that I used it to give to my um, MD students at Chitina uh, Hospital. So I will use this uh, briefly, and then I will turn to my uh, actual topic. Okay. So this gives some kind of a basic introduction to that one. 
See, all of you know that uh, MRI can be repeatedly done on uh, patients. Basically, it's a non-invasive technique. This kind of a slide I used, it's a very general slide, just to derive the home, the point that the RF radiation that is being used when a patient is inside the magnet does no harm to us. And all of you know that this is the kind of a electromagnetic spectrum. And X-ray have very high energy, high frequency, high energy of one photon, which is about 10.5 to 10.6 electron volts. And optical topography is in this range, and magnetic resonant ultrasound is in this range. As an example, we all are uh, in an uh, environment of electromagnetic radiation, right? Around us is going through the various TV channels and the all India radio and any radio channel. Okay, except that we are not able to hear or see any pictures because our eyes and ears are not tuned to that particular frequency. So basically in NMR what happens? When you put a patient or a molecule inside a magnetic field, the protons get excited. I'm giving an example of the first element of the periodic table which is the hydrogen, which is the proton. Most of the images are proton images, hydrogen images. So it gets magnetized and then it goes into the energy level, right? And the, the energy level separation depends upon the field. Lower the field, the energy level separation will be smaller. Higher, it goes high. So when you increase the field in normal NMR spectroscopy, Professor Husur was pointing out that today we have 1.2 gigahertz of NMR spectrometer. That means the energy level is increased so high that you find more number of nuclei in the lower energy state. So you have the sensitivity which is increased. But in MRA, getting a huge magnet where a patient has to go inside you cannot have a magnet which is uh, like for example uh, 9 tesla 11 tesla 200 tesla it's very difficult design technical considerations and then when you use high power rf when you increase the magnetic field then nerve stimulations can happen so most of the mris are at 1.5 and now at 3 tesla 3 tesla you also know all of you know about it so that when you have a 3 tesla magnetic uh, resonance imaging, the RF that you normally use is about 123 mahertz, which is very safe region over here. That's one of the reasons why MRI is a non-invasive technique. Professor Husura, I think Neil, I'm getting old. Neil made a statement um, that it is uh, originally called as NMRI. If you go through the books of the earlier uh, inventions of MRI, discovery of MRI, they would be actually giving it as a NMRI, Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Imaging. But the word of nuclear for some reason has a, a wrong connotation. It is always attached to nuclear bomb. Today we are hearing it, right? Every day when you switch on the NDTV and you think uh, Putin is giving the word nuclear. So everybody gets afraid, right? Including us. So the word of nuclear was quietly dropped from the literature so as to not to convey any wrong feelings to the physicians who is prescribing this test and also to the public who is taking this test investigation. So the word was quietly dropped. The word quiet is used in the literature, many of the books that it is uh, dropped from that one. That is one of the reasons why the patient can be n number of times can be subjected to MRI for longitudinal studies. What I mean by longitudinal studies is that when you do the experiment at different intervals when a patient is undergoing treatment, the response to treatment, the response to a particular kind of treatment regimen that the physician uses will vary from patient to patient. Even if he uses the same kind of a treatment regimen in group of patients, each patient will take it in a different way. The reason is that the human physiology is entirely different from one another. So the efficacy of the drugs in a group of patients given the same kind of a treatment will be highly dependent upon the individuals. So the response to treatment becomes very important. And when you give a treatment, the first thing that the physician wants to know is to find out whether the patient is responding to the particular treatment regimen given to her or him. If not, then they can actually change it. In that respect, repeated MRI can be done provided or as long as the patient pays for the MRI charges, right? 
But you cannot subject a patient to n number of CT scans or even small uh, X-rays, digital X-rays nowadays. Like in breast cancer, we use mammogram. You cannot do that because X-rays use very high energy. So it will destroy the tissue architecture completely. So that is one of the reasons why we actually call it MR as a non-invasive thing. I will come up to this little later. So what is basically magnetic resonance imaging is? Instead of having a line position that Professor Gosu pointed out, depending upon the hydrogen environment in a small molecule like a small amino acid or ethyl alcohol or protein or nucleic acid, if you want to talk about macromolecules, then those line positions has now to be converted into basically a distribution of hydrogens in a given region of interest or the voxel of interest. So basically MRI gives the structural information. What I mean by structural information is that different anatomy of a human body can easily be identified using this proton image. It gives the morphology in other terms or in other terms anatomy. You, what I have shown here is a very high resolution recorded 7 Tesla. It is prototype approved for brain imaging by FDA. You can see the different structures very nicely. So it gives the structural information. Within a particular region itself you are able to do it. That is the beauty of NMR. And these have nothing but the hydrogen distributions here. Instead of a line position that you are interested in a functional group from an amino acid, you are now interested in finding out the proton density in a particular region of a human brain. That's all. MR. It's very simple to understand in a qualitative term. Of course, the physics of it and the mathematics is very high. And it gives a superior soft tissue contrast. Superior is a word in English cannot exist on its own. It is a relative term. Superior with respect to what? Superior with respect to the existing modality as of today, CT, ultrasound and PET. So, reason is that we are exciting the hydrogens of the tissues. And the human body weight, 70 to 80 percent of the human body weight comes from the water that is present, the hydrogens that are present in the water and fat. So we are exploiting that hydrogens that are present in water and fat in the human body. That is what we are doing. So whereas the technique of CT and PET are different. So they don't give that kind of a soft tissue contrast. So it is superior with respect to the existing imaging modalities like CT scan and PET scan. And multiplanar imaging capability. That is the very versatile one. What do you mean by multiplanar is that? If I cut my head like that, this is an axial slice. If I cut my head like that, it is a coronal slice. If I cut my head like that, it is a sagittal slice. So I can generate the image without disturbing the patient. I don't know how many of you have undergone MRI scan. You will have to lay there in a still manner. You should not move your head if it is being imaged. If you are Breast is being imaged, you should not move your chest. If your prostate is there, you should not move your abdomen or calf muscle, ankle, whatever the region that you are interested in imaging. So you should not move it. That, that, you have to have a static one. That is the only requirement. So when you are imaging this static uh, 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 in a static position, nothing changes in MRI. You get the sound only because of the gradient magnetic field. Whereas in CT and other scenes, you can see the detector and the transmitter going down, making it nice, going here and there. The transmitter will be there, the receiver will be there. It is going. Nothing will change here. So that is the beauty of this technique. So you get the multiplanar imaging capability. Not only that, in today's world, I can get a slice which is like for example uh, orthogonal to the two normal orthogonal directions uh, oblique to the two orthogonal directions like coronal to sagittal minus 30 degrees and she doesn't want that I, I, she wants minus plus 27 degrees i can do that any oblique slice up to three oblique planes i can do that that is the beauty of the technique and nothing is done to the patient it's all by the jugglery of the rf waves rf 90 180 pulses that we do that just we jugglery that we get that one. So the other one is that you 
the images I already told you are from the protons and water. It is a non-invasive and functional information can be obtained. As and when I talk, you can do an MRI by putting me inside the magnet. I can now find out which part of the brain is activated when I am talking, when I am moving my left hand, which part of the brain. So basically functional MRI for some reason it has been always connotated with the cognitive functions of the brain but it is not generally true any function like i will give you an example to find out how a benign tumor is distinguished from a malignant tumor when we give some external contrast agent and trying to map up the image of the breast in real time that is also a function when I do the diffusion imaging, I will come up to that and explain what is the diffusion imaging. And the perfusion imaging, these are all function of time. In real time, we can do that. And those are also functional information that we can actually get. So basically, the role of in vivo magnetic resonance in clinical medicine is to distinguish between malignant and benign lesions. And also to identify small lesions which will give you an early indication of the tumor development then I can treat the patient accordingly. Because when you detect a tumor at an early stage, it is easily be cured sometimes, some of the tumors. And guiding biopsy and treatment response and then recurrence. Now, the basic principle of this particular imaging is nothing but this needle already showed. So you can image any part of the body, be it say for example the brain, or the heart, or the abdomen and the liver, or the whole spine, or gallbladder, knee, ankle, anything you can do that. So in MRI what we do, you have a huge magnet, basically with a magnet and a gradient coil and a an RF coil. Okay, and you put a patient inside. And then what you do is basically uh, transmit the RF, uh, whatever the frequency, if I am doing a 3 Tesla, I told you 123 megahertz roughly. And then you get the uh, wait for it 100 milliseconds, get the uh, RF emitted from the patient and repeat it two to a uh, uh, number of times, two, two times, three times, four times. Reason is that Neil pointed out to you in his first uh, opening remarks that NMR is basically an insensitive technique. That is why we are averaging. That's why averaging. That is why the number of the num the the length of the scan is about 30 minutes, 40 minutes, even sometimes one hour. Whereas CT is finished in one minute or two minutes. Because we have to average. And when we do the imaging of a brain, normally it takes about 20, 25 minutes. Reason is that we will get the image of the whole head. Not only two dimensional image, complete three dimensional image in all the three orthogonal planes or sometimes oblique planes. Reason why we need oblique planes is that the tumor when it develops inside the human organ, it doesn't do it in a uh, preferred orientation, right? It goes in all directions. It's completely heterogeneous in a three dimension. So getting an oblique plane gives you the indication of the location and the extent of the tumor within the region that you are actually imaging it, right? That is the reason. So you repeat it and then uh, get the uh, image and then send it to the packs where it can store and then the radiologist can see it. So this is what I meant. The images in the three. This is a transverse plane or the axial plane when I cut my head like that. And this is the coronal when I cut my head like that. And this is the sagittal when I cut my head like this one. You can see and identify each of the regions within the sagittal slice like corpus callosum, frontal lobe, car, uh, with the, sorry, cerebellum, corpus callosum, medulla oblongata, and the spine, the vertebrae, everything, tongue, and everything you can very easily identify. No external dye or contrast agent is given to identify these regions. It is an inherent tissue property which gives this contrast. That is the beauty of NMR. Um, let me give an example. I think, you see here, one more thing. See the high resolution imaging at 3 Tesla. Just one slice of 1 millimeter I have taken over here. And find out each of these regions, like, like for example, 11. 11 is somewhere here, mammillary bodies which is very tiny, less than about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 millimeter. I can very easily see that. And if there is an abnormality, the radiologist can very easily identify that. So such is the beauty of the technique when you have a high resolution imaging. Um, 
Yeah, now I think I am coming up to that. But I wanted to actually show you one more slide. Maybe it is not here. See, the tissue contrast, when you have the patient inside the magnet, I told you that the protons get magnetized and then they are in equilibrium state. Why you give RF is to excite these protons in the equilibrium state to understand about this system. I, will, I used to give a lot of examples, like for example, all of you know that uh, you are being taught the students are being taught for a semester and at the end of the semester we give an examination for three hours. Why do we need to give an examination? To find out how relatively each one of these students have understood what has, what has been taught in the class. Right? And we don't give the examination for six months. We give it only for three months or three hours. Similarly, you when you excite the equilibrium state of a brain tissue of a patient who is positioned inside the magnetic field, you give the RF only for few milliseconds, right, in NMR, right, 90 degree pulse or 180 degree pulse, few milliseconds only. And then afterwards what happens, you all know about it, I am just uh, recapitulating the, for the simplicity sake. The spins will relax back to the equilibrium uh, position and there are two time constants, I am not going into the details, T1 and T2, right. These two relaxation time constant actually determine the tissue contrast. Now, for example, if I want to have the T2 relaxation of a pure liquid, fat and impure liquid, this is how the T2 relaxation pattern looks like. Same protons but in different forms, pure liquid, fat and impure liquid, have a different T2 relaxation characteristics. So now, the question is that what is a pure liquid? Uh, everybody knows that it's uh, mineral water and any corporation or municipal water will have a lot of impurities. That is the only difference between a pure water and an impure water. And the impurities actually changes the complete characteristic nature of the water and hence the relaxation time. The relaxation of the spins coming back to the equilibrium state. So if you take this one to the reality, this is how it looks like. If you do the T2 relaxation characteristic, of a CSF. CSF is cerebrospinal fluid. And the other one is a brain matter. I don't distinguish between white and gray matter. They are entirely different. So if I do the experiment here by having a tau value of this range, instead of here, I can see the clear distinction between the two. So the tissue contrast that you see within a brain region is because of this relaxation behavior, which is an inherent tissue pro uh, uh, NMR tissue property. So you are not doing anything external, but certain times we give this external, okay? So I think I will stop with this one. So this is a brief introduction about uh, how uh, the basic principles of NMR actually work. Now I will go to my, uh, the original talk. Okay. Now, biomarkers are very essential. Reason is that unless you have a marker, if you want to monitor the progress of a disease or the regression of the tumor as a function of treatment, you need to have some kind of a marker. It can be even a simple volume or a diameter. It doesn't really matter. So the biomarkers plays a very, very important role. 
and it has lot of applications both in the preclinical and as well as in the clinical research. And the imaging of uh, techni imaging techniques that are available today are listed here like MR, PET, optical, molecular pathology with the, the I mean you have some biochemical tests also there and most of them are the imaging like even ultrasound, simple x-ray, CT scan, everything is there. Reason is that you can get a smaller anatomical detections because it has gone to very high level imaging whether it is CT or PET or uh, uh, MRI and you can also do the cellular imaging and also molecular imaging like determining the protein activity the effect of protein activity through the imaging and broader because you can have ultrasound focus ultrasound non-invasive angiography by MR I will I will not be giving an example but then one can also do angiography by MR now Osur has very nicely pointed out the developments of NMR from 1D to 2D and 3D and 4D and how it can be actually used to determine the structure of macromolecules. So if you for example wanted to find out the application of NMR in biology, I can broadly classify that in two categories. One is the structure of ma macromolecules, the other one is imaging and in vivo spectroscopy. Structure of macromolecules determining the protein structure or nucleic acid structure or studying their functions is a realm of normal NMR spectroscopy, which Professor Hosur and Ashutosh and others will point out to you at a later time. Hosur already pointed out. My job is to find out how this same uh, NMR can be used to image the protons within an organ and also use the NMR spectroscopy. The normal NMR spectroscopy that you are familiar in uh, solving a structure of a molecule, whether it be a small organic molecule or a macromolecule, it doesn't really matter. The same kind of a technique can be borrowed and can be done on a human being or any living organism, right? Then I will get the biochemical distribution of that tumor vis a vis a normal tissue that also can be done in one go. So basically, the imaging will be very useful for clinical diagnosis and the spectroscopy will be very useful to study the physiology and metabolism and that is why um, the MR has become a very powerful technique. No technique as of today can give all this information in one go. When I do the MRI, I can couple the NMR, in vivo NMR spectroscopy to find out the biochemical distribution of a tumor and then shift the region of interest to a normal tissue and get their biochemical distribution and then compare the two and find out what is different biochemically. Once I know biochemically what is different, I can find out the metabolic pathway in which these biochemicals are related and try to understand the metabolic pathways. Remember one thing, when a cell becomes cancerous, malignant, everything happens at the cellular level. When a tissue becomes malignant, everything happens at a cellular and molecular level. So here is a technique which not only gives the three-dimensional or two-dimensional structure of where the tumor is located in a particular region, but also gives the biochemical distribution of the tumor. And when I shift the oxal or the region of interest to the normal portion, it also gives the normal biochemical distribution of the normal tissue. Then I can compare and try to understand the complete metabolic pathway. Once I understand the metabolic pathway, I can talk more about the biology of the tumor. So here is a technique which is very, very useful. You can put any subjects, any, any living organism into the magnet and then I can get an image. We have done some work on plant when the initially when we installed an animal MRI scanner, we wanted to practice. So we did lot of work on brinjal, coconut, uh, mangoes and everything. And I, uh, I mean, fortunately or unfortunately, I have half a dozen publications in that also. And then it fetched me a trip to Japan, how it can be done. So, uh, the applications of NMR is enormous. You, you, you put an animal, you put a human being, you put a material. I can do it in oil exploration. That is one of the slides where Neil showed the oil exploration. You put a uh, chunk of... Uh, material there and I can find out the oil distribution or the water distribution through MRI. But then the technique is slightly different but one can actually do that. So that is one of the reasons why 
you can you can you just put a hand on anything and put it on MRI, it can give you an image. It's very, very versatile. So this I have already explained, so I'm not going into the details. Now I'm going to spend a few slides on imaging biomarkers from discovery to clinical practice. See, when biomark biomark biomarkers, especially imaging biomarkers, are, uh, in the, are discovered and then found out, there are several steps which take place in parallel and then they complement each other also. And they are actually given over here. Like for example, first phase is development and evaluation. Then you have to validate technically, biologically, clinically, whether that biomarker will be useful. Then if it is fit for research, then you go to the phase two, implementation of the trials, that, that's what I am. Then quantification, then utilization. And finally, the surrogate endpoint, utilization and routine pra practice in the clinical one. These are the steps. Now the question is, what constitutes a biomarker? I have taken the explanation from the uh, uh, white paper on imaging biomarker here. They define the biomarker as a characteristic that is measured objectively. Remember the word objectively, that is very important. You have a lot of biomarkers which can be subjective. Subjective is tend to have a lot of errors. And what I see subjectively may not be seen subjectively by Dr. Neil. Okay, so it is objectively as an indicator of normal biological process. Normal biological process means how a normal cells basically is turning into malignancy. And once it turns into the malignant state, then the pathology difference. So the, you can monitor the pathological changes. Uh, and then when you intervene by giving a drug, you can also study the response to an intervention. This is what basically constitutes a biomarker. And this biomarker can be a molecular or histological or radiographic or physiological characteristics. Uh, so you can have an imaging biomarker, you can have a pathological uh, biomarker. And in terms of, when you take in terms of imaging, it includes the anatomical information. The MRI pictures of head that 7 Tesla that I showed, it has rich information on anatomy. So it can be anatomical, it can be functional. If I do a contrast enhanced study to find out whether it is a benign tumor or a malignant, then I can actually find out the complete kinetic parameters of a benign tumor versus a malignant tumor or molecular characteristics. So these are the criteria that you need to satisfy, right? And the, the, and the other thing is that the advantage of imaging biomarkers is the versatility. It's widespread use and as I told you, most of the imaging techs are non-invasive in nature and you can do the whole body imaging and longitudinal studies for assessment of treatment response and even progression of the disease can be done with that. So this I can see, this is more or less the same. So what are the salient aspects of a good biomarker? You can have n number of biomarkers, but they may not exhibit the same kind of property. Again, the same definition. But the question that we need to ask is that, can this biomarker be quantifiable and will be useful? That's the first question. Can the biological changes be measured using the biomarkers during the progression of the disease or the regression of the disease? What is the sensitivity and the reproducibility? This, these are the questions that you need to ask when you actually discover a biomarker. And what is specific about, whether it is specific about a particular disease. What I mean by that is that some biomarkers may be common for all cancers. So the specificity is loses. Some patient comes with prostate cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer. If you are having the same thing, you cannot identify whether the patient is, is having with a colon cancer or a prostate cancer. Because it is not specific to a particular disease, it is a general biomarker. So is it specific to a particular disease? If it is specific then it gives much more indication for a radiologist or a pathologist to find out which tumor basically it is from. And the accuracy, how accurate you actually measure this value. And what are the random and systematic error and the precision which we measure that one. These are the questions that you need to ask and address this one before you actually go into a biomarker. And again, 
what are the advantages of the MRI parameters? Now, I gave an internal introduction about the imaging biomarker, which may include CT, PET, ultrasound, X-ray, MRI, etc. But now, I am specifically marketing myself for the MRI parameters. Ideally, there are number of characteristic imaging uh, parameters like sensitivity, specificity, uh, whether it is biologically very active, robust and quantifiable. Reason why MRI parameters to act as a biomarker basically stem from the fact that it has an advantage like earlier I pointed out superior soft tissue contrast and most of the tumors comes from the soft tissue that has present in them. Bone tumors are also there but 80 to 90 percent are all soft tissue tumors. So when you have a technique which is having a superior soft tissue contrast in comparison to the other imaging modalities, MRI scores much, much more over the other one. And it, it should have a high special resolution, that is what you see. So minor details that I have uh, pointed out to you, mammillary bodies, hippocampus, everything can easily be done. So we have a high sp spatial resolution. And the ability to obtain multiple contrast in single exam, you already have seen that brain image. It has a different places it is giving different contrast. So uh, you are able to identify the cerebral lobe from the frontal lobe, occipital lobe, medulla oblongata, spine, vertebrae, everything you easily see. So it has that basically to obtain multiple contrast and the ability to uh, uh, assess the physiology, especially the vascularization, oxygenation and diffusion. That is also possible. So that is one of the reasons why MR is now uh, very, very widely used uh, in imaging biomarkers. Or MR is the preferred choice. Right? Now, I made a statement that the biomarker has to be objectively evaluated, not subjectively. Now, why there is a need for objective assessment of the different MR parameters here? Now, what I have given in this particular slide is the number of tissue biomarkers that one can actually measure. I can measure simple proton density. What is the number of protons that are responsible to give a particular image from a particular brain area? So that gives the water content. Then I talked about the two relaxation times T1 and T2. That is a parameter, objective parameters. You can determine the T1 and T2 of the different tissues, right? And the diffusion and its tensor, the diffusion of the hydrogens can easily be monitored, right? Suppose, for example, I have a cup of water that is sitting there. The hydrogens diffuse at any given point of time. What is MRI? MRI, proton MRI is nothing but spatial distribution of hydrogens that are present in water and fat in the human tissues. Tissues are more like a semi-solid form. So the same kind of diffusion that you see in an aqueous medium can, is also happening in the tissue. Hydrogens move through. So the diffusion of the hydrogens within the tissue can easily be monitored. I don't have a slide for you to tell that. Basically, this diffusion MRI is an investigation by an MR sequence which takes only one minute, less than a minute. But it has ample information on that. The reason is that you all are aware of many people getting sick because of heart attack. Right? Cardiac arrest. And people think that cardiac arrest is the end of it. But remember one thing, if you have a cardiac problem, the heart can be easily replaced. You have an open heart surgery where heart replacement is possible. But the same stroke, when it comes to the brain, you cannot replace your head. All of you would have heard that a particular patient had a stroke and he is not able to move his left hand, left leg. He is completely paralyzed for the whole of his life. Just because in one part of the brain, the area of the brain which is responsible for the movement 
is completely affected because of the stroke. What is stroke? In scientific terms, we call it as an ischemic attack. What is ischemic attack? When a stroke takes place, there are two ways in which the stroke can take place. One is due to lack of blood supply to the brain. The other one is rupture of the blood vessels within the brain. When there is a lack of blood flow in a brain, in a particular area, say for example, I am moving my hand like that. There is a motor cortex area which controls the movement of my hand. In that particular area of motor cortex, if there is a lack of blood supply because of narrowing of the blood vessels, what will happen? Lack of blood supply will lead to lack of oxygen. When there is lack of oxygen, the tissue will die. Because oxygen is essential for survival. So the tissue will die. What I mean by tissue dies? Basically it is nothing but the characteristic nature of the water in that particular area because of lack of blood supply changes completely. I have a cup of water. Suppose now I put one gram of salt. Will the diffusion of the hydrogens will be the same? No. Same thing happens in the brain. Under normal circumstances, there will be a diffusion of the hydrogens. For example, the motor cortex area. I am moving my right. That means left hemisphere, there is a motor cortex area. The blood supply is normal. Suppose there is a lack of blood supply in that particular area. Because of lack of blood supply, the lack of oxygen, the tissue dies and the characteristic nature of the tissue in that particular area completely changes which will affect the diffusion of the water molecules. Reason again, the tissue contains so many proteins, macromolecules in that particular region. So when the water mobility because of oxygen, lack of oxygen dies, the complete characteristic nature of the proteins and the macromolecules present in that particular region changes. So the diffusion of the water is now not the same as this one. So this particular sequence, I can do it in one minute and tell the patient that this is because of this one. Similar thing can also happen when there is rupture of the blood vessels. When there is a rupture of the blood vessels, the blood may not go to the other areas because it's a leaky in that one particular area, water leakage. Then again the stroke can happen. Stroke, whenever you see a social message, whenever you see somebody is saying that I am having some weakness on the right hand or left hand or my left leg or right leg, just observe them and see whether their behavior also changes. Sometimes they may not talk coherently. You ask, say for example, there was a very senior advisor in uh, DST. He one day phoned me and then uh, I asked a certain question, he did not then immediately I said, you have something problem, you come to Ames, immediately I took him and then it was identified as a stroke, even though I am not a clinician. I am a basic physicist, not even a chemist. So because of the observation, we can easily say that. And he was immediately given the drug and then do that. So immediately you have to take them to a clinician and they have to identify whether the stroke is because of lack of blood supply or because of rupture of the blood vessels. The treatment in both the cases are different. So the diffusion imaging by NMR, when we use in MRI, just a one minute scan can save their life. And so many other parameters like uh, dynamic contrast, I will give you blood perfusion, same blood when there is goes with perfusion in there. So all these parameters are now available for you as a uh, biomarker. So now the question I am asking is, I am now giving you some examples of each of these one from our work. Can biomarkers be used to monitor metabolism induced morphological changes? When cell proliferates, when cell proliferates uncontrollably, that is a cancer. So then it destroys all the other structures nearby and damages the structure and the morphology. Can I now do that? Now, what is this malignant transformation actually leads to? One thing is it can lead to structural changes which will eventually alter the morphology and the microenvironment. 
The other one is that at the cellular and molecular level, changes in the bio, biochemical and metabolic alterations, which can be measured by in vivo spectroscopy. So remember the structural changes in everything I can study by routine MRI and dynamic contrast and diffusion MRI. And this one can be studied by spectroscopy. This is what it is. Grass anatomy of the tissue characteristics turning into tumor. So I can monitor the microvasculature, the perfusion, permeability. And then I can also do the microstructural by diffusion MRI. This is by dynamic contrast. And then this diffusion will also give this information. And the MRS can give the complete energy metabolism, the neuronal status of the tissues if you are it in brain. Now, if we take the cancer progression, I am uh, I, I'm talking from the point of view of imaging. Basically, it leads to high metabolic demand of oxygen and nutrients, which is basically achieved by angiogenesis and then abnormal vasculature it will lead to and permeability leading to hypoxia in tumor microenvironment and then it will change the complete perfusion characteristics of the blood flow. And that can be measured by extracellular volume and other kinetic parameters by dynamic contrast. So these changes when cancer progresses, I can use a dynamic contrast MRI to find out that. What is the dynamic contrast MRI? What I have shown on the left panel is a simple T1 weighted image of a breast cancer patient. You can see the cancer here and this is a T2 weighted image. The contrast changes. This is hyperintense, this is hypointense. Now, here is a case of a very small tumor of a patient, and I need to find out whether it is a benign tumor or a malignant tumor. This is also another case where it is a very small tumor. So, under normal circumstances, the tissue contrast that you have seen between different regions of the breast or brain or prostate or whatever it is. I told you it is an inherent tissue property because of the NMR, NMR phenomena, right? No contrast is given. Unlike in CT and other things spent, we give a dye injection or a radioactive nuclear injection. But there are circumstances in MRI where the tissue contrast between a normal tissue or a benign tissue or a malignant tissue may not be very great for the radiologist to interpret the image. Under such circumstances, we give a contrast. A contrast basically based on gadolinium. Gadolinium is a paramagnetic. Let me not go into the physics of it. It is a gadolinium based paramagnetic injection. We give the contrast intravenously to the patient and start acquiring the image at every minute. And when I acquire the image of the breast at every minute, then I get a series of patterns of the enhancement of the contrast of the tumor. If it is a benign tumor, I don't know how many of you can see this red line, it progressively increases. But if it is a tumor, it has a sharp increase and a sharp fall. So that will distinguish whether it is a benign tumor or a malignant tumor. Reason is that, huh? this is a time uh, in intensity, time versus the intensity. So, reason is that when the cell proliferates uncontrollably, uncontrollably, it destroys the blood-brain barrier. When the blood-brain barrier is broken, this contrast that you give, which is a paramagnetic, goes and attaches itself to the tumor site. Under normal circumstances, if there is no breakage in the blood-brain barrier, it goes and then washes out. It, so the contrast enhancement in a benign tumor will take two minutes or three minutes to reach the plan, high, highest level, whereas here within a minute it will reach the highest point. So that will give me an indication that it is a malignant tumor because there is a rupture of the blood brain barrier in the tumor cells. So that is, yeah. It is a membrane rupture. This is only time intensity at different points that I acquire. I give the contrast, I get the image in the first minute, second minute, th third minute, like that I do it for 10, 10 minutes. That intensity of the signal, I will do that. 
Here, basically what happens, usually we call it as blood brain barrier, but that we do it, it is membrane rupture when that develops here. The membrane here ruptures, the tumor here. So then the contrast actually is filtered. No, no, there is no capsule here. That, that, that is a different uh, that is a different issue no but here no it, it is a membrane rupture here it's a membrane rupture I just gave an example member blood brain barrier basically it's a membrane rupture when the membrane rupture comes it acts more like a blood brain barrier so the contrast goes inside and attaches and it promotes the relaxation basically it is a paramagnetic muscles are diamagnetic and the relaxation is promoted so I get a contrast very quickly within a minute in, in, a, in a malignant fever. Whereas in benign it takes two to three minutes to enhance. So that will give you an indication for me whether it is a benign tumor or a malignant tumor. Under certain circumstances only we do that. Like for example in this one I don't have to do anything. This T1 and T2 somebody was asking it is same. Yeah it has to be same. It is a two relaxation constants are there, not spin lattice relaxation and spin spin relaxation. So it, T1 weighted means I am giving more weightage to the T1 relaxation characteristics. It is not, we don't get a pure T1 image, pure T2 image in MRI because both are occurring simultaneously. Okay, so you cannot separate them out. So that is why it, all, when I do a T1 weighted image, I give more emphasis for the T1 relaxation characteristic. When I do the T2 weighted image, the parameters change. The echo time and the repetition time will change. That will give you the weighting of that one. Okay, so it has to give the same, basically. Right? So now I can easily identify which is the one. Now, we did a lot of diffusion work. Uh, uh, more, more than about close to about 500 patients and found out how the diffusion can identify the tumor. This normal breast diffusion. See, you more or less uniform density and the diffuse coefficient at any point you measure would right. And see, for example, in a tumor, this is ipo intense, this is the tumor region, and this is a contralateral breast which is unaffected. Contralateral breast, the diffusion coefficient 1.6 is the same from the barrel yes. Whereas tumor, it is 0.91. So in a series of studies on close to about 500 patients and control 54, you see it is 1.78. Contralateral, which is unaffected in 35 patients, we were able to do it. The beauty of MR is that the same patient will serve as a control. I don't have to have a separate control group. That's the beauty of this one. So in benign, you see it is 1.57. Whereas in pre-therapy in breast cancer patients, it is 1.02. Okay, so benign is somewhere in between, whereas uh, in malignant it is much lower. So we can easily distinguish with the benign and the malignant and with the control, the healthy volunteers, and also the contralateral breast, which is unaffected. So this diffusion imaging becomes a very, very useful uh, methodology for us to find out this one. Now when you give therapy, basically what it does, it induces metabolic change. Now, can I use this diffusion MRI to find out as an objective for our biomarker, the region outside the tumor, how far the viable cancer cells are there? The important question for a surgeon when he is doing a surgery, whatever may be the surgery, here it is a breast cancer, is that what is the level of normal tissues that he has to remove from the cancerous periphery. Because normally they will not only resect only the tumor, but they actually go one to two centimeters. It's basically a subjective criteria. Now we are giving an objective criteria. So what we did in a group of patients, right, like, we drew concentric circles along the periphery of the tumor. Five concentric circles, not circle, it is as per the contour of the tumor. Five, each five millimeter, that means up to 2.5 centimeters. And when we did the ADC calculation, the diffusion coefficient in each of these one, 
we found out that up to about 2 centimeters, the cancer cells are viable. The diffusion constant was lower. So we gave the physicians the idea that you safely remove up to 2 centimeters. This is what Neil was telling. How our work is translated into basic clinical utility. So now in our aims, most of the breast cancer, they remove 2 centimeters, roughly. So this objective parameter of a diffusion coefficient is now serving me as a biomarker to identify the viable cells from the periphery to the normal tissue, how much centimeter the viable cancer cells are there. If he removes up to 2 centimeters, he is more or less sure that there are no cancer cells outside this region. Yes, uh, basically even with the T1 and T2 is uh, weighted image, depending upon the characteristics, we can do that stage and then compare it with the another parameter called BIRADS. Uh, 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 BIRADS is uh, radiological bio, uh, breast imaging parameters. We can compare it ideally. That is also we have done with the normal one. Now, this is the examples that I gave till now basically stems from the fact that there are certain structural changes or anatomical changes that the cancer has introduced into the tissues. So you are basically monitoring, monitoring the morphology. Now I, I, I told you an example that this only technique can give the biochemical distribution also. So what happens is that basically when malignant transformation takes place it leads to biochemical and metabolic alterations that will affect the water, lipid composition and lipase activity and also it affects the choline kinase activity, membrane biosynthesis and all these leads to changes in the metabolic levels and that I can monitor through MR spectroscopy. Now we did this on number of breast cancer patients. Uh, in fact, like Neil pointed out, this is one of our seminal contribution when everybody was concentrating on brain, which is uh, re very rich in biochemicals, I concentrated on breast. Breast is very difficult to do because we always have some kind of a chest wall movement and also some respiratory movement will cause the breast to move. So any movement I told you, you know, the patient has to lay still, any movement will introduce artifact in imaging. And especially when I do spectroscopy, it will alter the line position. Uh, it, it will be very broad or sometimes uh, if it is close lines, it will merge with each other. So here what we have done basically is putting a voxel here and then did the NMR spectrum, the normal one. Uh, there are methods to get this localized voxel spectroscopy. This is what I told when I started my career in 1988-89 in USA. The localization is a very important. At that time, the localized spectroscopy was not developed. So we used to get, get the MRI machine only around 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock in the night. That's, I am I'm not a, uh, like Neil, I am not a uh, late worker. I work only between 9 and 7 or 8. But then th those days, we don't get the MRI during normal working hours because it is for the patients. So we get for research only around 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock. So I go home, take my lunch, come back and then do it at, uh, at till eight, uh, 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the morning. So once I got this localization, it was around 1.15, it started working. Because those earlier days, none of the programs are standardized. So we have to develop our own. So when I did that kind of spectrum, basically it contains water and lipid. Because breast contains a lot of uh, fatty materials and water. So basically then you have two parameters, water to lipid ratio, you can do that. Uh, calculate the area and calculate it. So quantification can be done, some, some, some kind of a semi-quantitative matter. But then, then later we started suppressing the water. When we suppress the water and the fat, we were able to see the choline. In fact, this was the first seminal paper which would uh, be internationally known uh, when we published in 1998, I think. Uh, showing cancer can be, uh, choline can be a biomarker. So this choline, initially we started observing it as a presence or absence of choline. That is the evolution of the research that we did. First of all, very subjective. 
see whether it is yes or no, present or no. Then it, if it is present, then it is uh, cancer. If it is not present, then it is a benign. Very, very subjective. Then later one of my students did semi-quantitative method. You can calculate the signal to Nash ratio. We are NMR spectroscopists. We know how to do that. So then there is a semi-quantitative we introduced with signal to ratio. Then my fourth student start doing the absolute quantification. Absolute quantification in in vivo is difficult. When we do in normal 1D spectroscopy of any organic molecule, you put a TSP or some, some reference compound with respect to that molar concentration, you can determine that we do it in metabolomics day in and day out. But here, everything has to be in in vivo. Remember, it's a patient which is inside the magnet. You cannot experiment for more than 30, 40 minutes. Maximum is 45 minutes. A patient will not cooperate. So we developed a method by using the tissue water itself as a standard and calculating the relaxation characteristics and applying all the correction factors like internal water referencing and external water referencing. Then we were able to find out that quantitative assessment can also give very accurate information and in young women we can reach a sensitivity of about 100% close to that. So this is how NMR spectral profile in vivo spectral profile of a breast looks like normal breast. If I put the voxel here, it is lipid. You can identify each one of them. Remember, it was at 1.5 Tesla. I am able to get a resolution wherein you can identify the different lipids also very nicely. But you have to have a technique to do the shimming. And uh, being an NMR spectroscopist, we know how to shim. And uh, and then later, uh, one of you asked stage of the tumor. C, we recruited T1, T2, T, T4 stage. C, the spectral characteristics are entirely different. T1 stage, you have le more water, lesser fat compared to the normal one. And T2 stage, more water, less thick. And in t 4 advanced stage, it is only water and very less lipid. So the water to fat ratio, even though it is not very uh, robust parameter, still can be used to monitor the stage as well as the response to treatment. Now remember, women always undergo a lot of hormonal changes in her lifetime, in her even monthly time. So when I use this water to fat ratio as a biomarker, I need to be very careful. Careful in many respects. One, where my wax cell I am going to put. Is it in upper quadrant of the breast or lower quadrant or near the ripple region? You see the characteristic pattern of a normal volunteer, if I put the voxel in upper or lower quadrant, it is more or less same compared to if I put it in the near the peroalidal pero region which is near the nipple, which has more water. So depending upon where my voxel is, the water to fat ratio will differ. So you need to, this, this is a confounding factor. So you need to understand the human physiology before you interpret the results. The other thing is that we use this water to fat ratio as a function of the menstrual cycle. So we recruited close to about 60 volunteers who were undergoing menstruation at different stages we recorded the spectrum and this is what I found in the near the nipple region, paraoreal region, the water to fat ratio goes like this one. This is in the proliferative phase, follicular phase, luteal phase, secretory phase and menstrual phase. So depending upon at which stage the cancer patient comes to me, I need to apply that to interpret my water fat ratio. Water fat ratio will be less in tumor. But if she comes during the luteal phase, it will be already be less. So I need to take this into account when I actually interpret the data. So these are all, uh, in medicine, no, many of the negative results are very important, not the positive results. I will, I will give you an example when I do the actual in vivo fluorine spectroscopy of the chemo drugs. We did not get exact, exciting results, but then that result is very useful, uh, basically. Right. Then we can also monitor the lipid metabolism using this water to fat ratio. So you see here, this is uh, the patient <coughs> from this voxel, you can see water to lipid, this is a different patient, this is one is uh, malignant, benign and normal tissue. And then I can monitor the fat fraction, calculate the fat fraction, okay, and then find out in malignant it is less compared to benign and healthy. 
So this lipid metabolism also I can do that by just monitoring the spectral profile and calculating the water to fat ratio. Right? This is one as a biomarker, the same thing here. Now, when we were doing this experiment using water to fat ratio, even though it is not very objective, we are able to find out that in fibroadenoma, which is a benign tumor, we have, say for example, only water, nothing is there. <coughs> and in some case of benign, where there is a cystic fibro fibrosis, uh, and there is fibrocystic changes, we find even choline it's in some of them. One day, there was a patient who came to us and she was lactating at that time. She has a small baby. And as usual, it happens, the student who is supposed to do this experiment did not come. So I have to go and do my experiment. So when we do this, when we did this, when I did this experiment, you can find out here that this patient in an unaffected breast showed choline, also lactose because of the sugar and the lipid peak. This is 1.5 Tesla in vivo spectrum. See the kind of resolution you can get. When you are an MR spectroscopy, you can actually shift the magnet within that particular box and get it. That means this choline absence or presence, a subjective way in which we interpreted in our earlier research will no longer hold good. Because even in lactating breast you are seeing choline and in some of the benign tumors also we are seeing choline. Later when we started studying about the choline mechanism, choline is basically related to dietary factors also. In fact, when, I, when we did a study comparing the MR spectroscopy of Indian women with Western women, most of the Western women showed more choline because their dietary factors are entirely different. They eat more of, every one of them eat a lot of protein from meat and all. So the choline level is normally higher compared to the Indian women. So coming back to the story here, that means choline I cannot, presence or absence I cannot use it as a biomarker. Now I have to go to the next level wherein we determine the absolute quantification. You see here, this is a malignant tumor. This is the choline peak. And that one way is semi-quantitative, as I already told you. Then the, uh, another one is absolute quantification. There are two ways to do it. One is internal water referencing, or you use an external water as a referencing. And this is a benign. You can see choline here. And this is a normal. In normal also, you see the choline. So when we determine the internal water as a standard, and determine the codeine concentration, you will find out that this locally, LABC is locally advanced breast cancer. This is found in 90% of the women in India. And this is a early breast cancer. There is not much difference between the codeine concentration. Whereas in benign, it is much less than the, uh, the both the cancer, the early or the locally advanced, and the normal tissue is much less. Normal tissue also contains codeine. So we did the complete heterogeneity of the breast tumors by measuring the concentration between different, uh, say for example, ER positive, ER negative, then etunio plus etunio minus. And we, we did not find much difference in the choline concentration when we did this hormonal level dependence of the choline. Then we also did this as a function of treatment, the choline concentration over here. See here, this is a multi-voxel spectroscopy. I made a statement that the, the advantage of MR is that the same patient can serve as a control. Now I am giving an example. Instead of a single voxel that I have put in my earlier slide, now I am putting a multi-voxel. Multi-voxel means I am covering the whole tumor. Whole tumor is taken into account. And this is a multi-voxel spectroscopy. Each of these square, I can get a spectrum. And you see here, two representative examples. I can see the choline in all of them. So this is a malignant tumor because choline is seen in all of them. And we calculated the signal to ratio, which is 7.1 before treatment. And this is the metabolic mapping. So high concentration of choline is given by basically the red. And whatever you see here, this white portion, 
is a tumor and this is a normal portion. Normal portion, you see the lipid peak here, which you don't see in the tumor here. So in one go, I am comparing the normal tissue versus the abnormal tissue. The same control. So I don't have to recruit a control separately for this one. So then I made a, uh, I showed you a slide that a lactating women also showed a choline. So what is the mechanism to see choline in a lactating women vis-a-vis -a, -vis a malignant patient? So we did this one basically and recruited about say for, for example I think 14 or 15 volunteers who are lactating and we were able to find out lactose in most of them. And this is the tumor patient but in lactating breast you see choline but also the lactose. So that can very easily distinguish between that. But if you determine the choline concentration of a lactating normal women volunteer versus the choline concentration, it is more or less the same. So what we did is that we coupled with the MR spectroscopy the diffusion imaging. Now, why I coupled diffusion imaging? One is a lactating breast. Lactating breast means the women la has a lot of milk in the breast. So when more milk is there, the water characteristics which we are measuring diffusion changes. So when we did that one, you can find out that is in a malignant tumor, the ADC was less, whereas in a lactating woman, 1.62 versus 1.1. So clearly, ADC gives a clear demarcation between a lactating breast vis-a-vis -vis a normal breast. Whereas choline concentration remains same. So if you plot choline concentration versus ADC, you can find out the lactating uh, separately and the malignant one separately. So you can identify very easily. So ma most of the t uh, times, the multi-parametric imaging, we call it as a multi-parametric imaging. One is MR spectroscopy wherein we are determining the choline concentration. The other parameter is the apparent diffusion, diffusion coefficient of the thing. So it's a multi-parametric imaging will give the clear distinction whether it is a tumor or a lactating breast. Um, so I will skip this one and go to the response to treatment. See here, the same diffusion imaging. This is another seminal paper which we published in 2009. One minute scan, this is in a respondent. You see this is the tumor prior to therapy after first cycle, it reduced considerably with the ADC increasing from 0.8 to 1.33. And after third cycle, complete disappearance of the tumor and the ADC is 1.66. This is a case of a non-responder. As you can see, the tumor size remains more or less the same. So also the ADC. So in one minute, I can give the physician whether the patient is responding to the treatment or not through diffusion imaging. So this is another very important one. You can use the spectroscopy also to do that same thing. Water to fat ratio prior to therapy, this is how the spectrum profile looks like and this is post-therapy. And when you compare pre-therapy versus post-therapy, you can see the reduction in the water to fat ratio. So I can use it as an objective parameter to determine that. And also the <coughs> signal to noise ratio in multivoxel spectroscopy. See here in responder, this particular is a tumor and one voxel showed choline as an example, representative example. And the tumor shrinked after third cycle. And when I put the voxel here, there is a disappearance of the choline peak. This is in a non-responder. You can see the tumor remains more or less of the same volume. When I put a voxel here, I see choline. When I put a voxel here, I see the choline. I measured the choline uh, uh, semi-quantitatively, the choline uh, uh, signal to noise ratio. Before therapy, 7.1 reduced to about 3.1. So this way, I can use this biomarker to find out. Not only that, the absolute concentration can also be determined. So this is another set of patients where Responder 3.78 millimolar per kg weight reduced to 0.58. Whereas here in non-responder, the choline peak remains same, the concentration also remains more or less the same. So I can give within third cycle or even first cycle the physician whether the patient is responding or not. If it's not responding, they may resort to some other treatment procedure instead of subjecting them to uh, unnecessary thing. So you can also now combine the diffusion weighted imaging with the uh, MR spectroscopy. This is a diffusion imaging and MR spectroscopy of a responder before the therapy and after therapy. This is a tumor and this is a choline peak from MRS. Reduced 
increased ADC which is uh, concomitant with the normal uh, tissue and choline also reduced concomitantly. Whereas in a poor responder, tumor size more or less remains the same. So also the ADC and the choline concentration also remains the same. So you can now plot a three-dimensional plot with the pathological response and clinical response after uh, first cycle, second cycle, third cycle. You can see the clear demarcation between the responder and the non-responder. So such uh, uh, objective uh, assessment can also be done. Not only that, drug research, yes. Uh, yeah, I showed one slide. No, it didn't vary with the RPR or uh, 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 even with the R2. There was no difference between that. We could not find out. A breast cancer across across the breast cancer, but then within the ERPR and R2 new, we we did not find any difference. Suppose we do more number of patients, there may be a difference. But in medicine, remember one thing, when the patient number is increased, the results that I am showing may change. But when you say that it is a poor prognosis, mm. so uh, what, uh, uh, do you remember that what was the treatment this patient was getting? Yeah, we know the treatment. I did not show you. We, mm. we, we know what are all the treatment regimens these patients actually undergo. So depending upon that, then we will give that. Yes. You know that. You yes. Know. So I was just asking this question that uh, is it the poor prognosis for all kind of uh, treatments uh, which you want to uh, say here or it may be... No. I made a statement that response of individuals is different from one with other. Yeah. So the same treatment given to say seven patients, two of them will respond, two of them may not, the other five of them may not respond. Okay. So it's not universal. Okay. It's highly personalized. Okay. Depends upon the human physiology and metabolism. Okay, thank yeah. you. Sir. So we can also monitor the drug in vivo. She has a question. Yeah. According to level of uh, choline, we can uh, uh, detect the treatments we will give to each uh, patient. No, no, no. Treatment is the normal breast cancer treatment. According to stage of uh, cancer and uh, Yes, only we are measuring the concentration of the choline. Not according to biomarker or something huh? like Not according to level of biomarker. No, not according to level of biomarker in blood or something. It's up. The treatment. No, no, I am not able to actually decipher that question. So you see the different choline levels. Hmm. So can the physician change the treatment regime? Hmm. Ah, that is what we are giving the information. See, our idea is to give the physician whether this particular patient will respond or not. Huh. Okay? Then the apps are giving. Yeah. Then the, the physician will change the treatment. And yes. if he wants that also to be monitored, we can do that. Yes. That part of it we have not given. Hmm. Basically, our idea is to give, assist the physician whether this patient will respond or not. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, by measuring the diffusion coefficient and the choline parameter. And we will give, this patient may not respond, so you can change the regimen. So that is what we give. But uh, afterwards, when, once hmm. they change it, we don't recruit the patient again to do that one. We can do that number of possibilities there. We can do that study also, but mm -hmm. we did not do that. Yeah, okay. that is possible. Yes. Thank you. Now, in vivo monitoring is another very important aspect. And this kind of study, not everybody will do it. And nowadays, nobody does it actually. Now, all these breast cancer patients basically undergo chemotherapy. When chemotherapy is given to the patients, they are given with a modulator. Uh, like for example, methyltrexoride. Half an hour before or after? after. The, basically, the function of modulator is to increase the efficacy of absorption of the chemotherapy. So we wanted to find out whether giving the modulator before 5-FU or after 5-FU has any effect. Right? So we did the complete in vivo fluorine in the body. Fluorine in the body is there, but under normal circumstances, we cannot monitor it. So we have to build a separate coil from that. 
Okay? We have to build a separate coil and then do the spectroscopy. It's a laborious work. So what we did that we built a fluorine coil and put it on the liver of the patient and the patient was given in IV the 5 fluorouracil the drug along with the methyl drug etc. As then when the injection is given we took the spectrum of the fluorine from the liver right in real time this is also functional MR only in real time so what I have shown here this is the normal level where you see the fluorine peak here which is basically 5 FU after 3.5 7 seconds 10.5 seconds like that around 10.5 you see this goes this as, as soon as you give this uh, 5 FU it goes to the anabolic and catabolic pathway and the catabolic pathway where you have the 5, 5 FU that is the 5 FU or 5 F bar fluoro beta alanine so it comes within 10.5 this is in patients where the modulator is given before 5 FU. And in the other case, where we have done the methyl trixorate after the 5 FU, we also again find out around 7 to 10.5 minutes the fluoro beta alanine comes into picture. So, our take home message to them is that whether you give the modulator before or after doesn't make any difference. So, you can give it either before or after, it doesn't make much difference. So, it is not a very exciting result, but one can actually do that. The other thing that we also did, well, this was my boss, right? The many depressive patients are given lithium carbonate either in a single dose of 900 milligrams or in divided dose of 300 milligrams three times a day. All these are many depressive patients, Vietnam veterans, army veterans, they go into depression. So they get bipolar disorders. So they are given this one. So we wanted to find out how much of the concentration of the drug given goes into the brain. Why brain? Because brain is the seat of action. How these many depressive patients have uh, manifest this depression? It is basically because of the ionic imbalance, lithium and sodium ion in the brain. So these bipolar disorders basically have a lithium concentration deficiency. So that is why lithium carbonate is given in 900 milligrams per dose right so now we found out how much concentration is going into the brain and there is no other technique which can determine other than in vivo lithium spectroscopy again lithium in the brain or in the tissue cannot be detected under normal circumstances because the concentration is low because the concentration is low nmr uh, is not sensitive enough to pick up that one so whatever the lithium that you pick up is coming from this exogenous injection that we have given. So in all these cases remember one thing when we do uh, MRI and MVO spectroscopy most of the time we become volunteers because normally we in the AIMS we used to give 500 rupees to the, our staff they will come but after two three times nobody will come even if you give 1000 rupees nobody will come as volunteer because they have to lay still for one hour. So most of the time we ourselves this is my boss with whom I learnt MRI technique. So we built a guy and he himself acted as a volunteer and you see here this is on day one and this is a standard lithium carbonate on day five it progressively increases and in the brain and then when we did the uh, uh, actual patient you can see here this is the actual patient and then compare it with the flame photometry flame photometry is the only technique which will give the concentration in the blood right as soon when you take the drug it goes everywhere in the body right so what you determine from uh, flame photometry can may not be sure because it goes everywhere in the body how do you know what is the concentration in the brain you you, you cannot do that so that is why we did the lithium uh, nmr spectroscopy in vivo so but, but what we did that we not only determine the concentration in the head but we also determine another extreme which is in the calf muscle because it goes everywhere so this is a, a combination of serum this is the serum level and this is the uh, brain, brain level and this is the calf muscle level. You see the head one, basically this is calf muscle, it decreases and blood also in seventh day decreases and then later increases. More or less coinciding with the serum level. When we had this result, we integrated that uh, patient, particular patient. And then particular patient, he stopped the drug for two days. And that is why you see the DP. So the non-compliance of the drug also we find out very easily because 
whatever the concentration you determine is from the drug that you've given externally. It is not the internal lithium concentration because the lithium concentration in the normal human tissue is much less. You cannot detect it by under normal circumstances at 1.5 or 3 Tesla, the lithium uh, spectroscopy. So whatever I have given is from external source. The moment he stopped the drug for two days, the lithium concentration decreases. So what, why I am giving this example is that these are all possible to do that. But it, looks, uh, it, it takes a lot of uh, yeah, energy, time and also uh, expertise to do that one. So finally, so many parameters are there in MR, imaging parameters. I have confined myself to the uh, ADC parent diffusion coefficient that uh, when you do the dynamic contrast, you can measure the actual kinetics, K-trans, cryptosis, then MR spectroscopy, water fat ratio, choline. They can all be used to differentiate between malignant, brigand and normal tissues. Then when you do the T1 and T2, you can even measure the tumor volume and diameter. And all can be used to find out whether they are responding to treatment or not. That is, assessment of tumor response can be done. And multiparameter quantitative approach is a better predictor for tumor response. I combine diffusion and MR spectroscopy or dynamic contrast, diffusion and MR spectroscopy. Multiparametric becomes much more efficient compared to a single parametric one. So all this work I have done uh, in AIMS. These are my students uh, who basically did this work and so many collaborators like Surgeon Sino is a statistician, is a pathologist, both of them, is a radiologist and then radiotherapist both of them, this one. And uh, luckily for all complete two to uh, two and a half decades DST provided fund for carrying out this work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeff, for giving us a proper overview, I mean, I say a large overview of the MRI and its application, especially the biomarker and how the drug, the pharmacokinetics and everything, which are completely, I mean, in the living system, explicitly, in your real estate, you are looking at uh, how your parents are happening. And this is that's what's the beauty of combining both the imaging and the spectroscopy technique and which she talked about. And it's only very few of them, I think, in India are doing this MRI. And yeah, not many. Not many. Not not many. Yes. So only in few clinical settings they are done. And because it requires an expertise. So, so if you have all the questions, any questions or anything, you can ask as many things for discuss and so if you have anything you can ask right now. So, sir, as usual, pleasant talk, so <laughs> wonderful, thank you. So I was asking the diffusion experiment that you did. Um, in cancer also, the, the, like a, the glycokinex or the glycane networks also changes depending upon the gradation of the, of the cancer. Now you are measuring basically water diffusion, right? So how does water diffusion changes depending upon how tight uh, the, the uh, glycanes are around a tissue? So no, why I'm asking because glycans being again OH group, lots of OH group. So there is a possibility that water gets more engaged as a bound water with the glycans. Uh, and it's possible, but we have not looked into. So we have not looked into. Actually, one can actually look into. You, uh, the, your question is very valid. Some student can look into it and find out whether it has uh, the by exponential behavior uh, through relaxometry. Uh, that would that would be possible to do that. Yeah, that's a good question. But we are not looking into. We are only seeing the effect of it, mm -hmm. and the cause. We don't know what cause it is. Mm -hmm. We know that it changes the architecture because of the architecture change, the diffusion characteristics of the hydrogens in the water changes, and then we are measuring in a grass term. Mm -hmm. But what is it due to? We don't. And in the lithium experiment, that's again fascinating that you showed. 
so generally these drugs are like atp um, atp lithium no if i, I no this is a lithium card it's a simple lithium card okay simple lithium card okay and where does it bind it binds to phosphorus like which um, moiety in this no no idea how does it act nobody knows no. oh okay the, the reason why we did that we had a question whether the 900 mg is enough or we have to increase so the psychiatrist was wanting to know whether we can increase the dose and uh, then we found out how much of concentration it goes into the brain let us measure so then we started building the coil and stamped it on basically okay i'll talk to you about yeah. this thank you As usual, sir, it was a wonderful talk. So I just want to ask you, someone asked the question that you, we can do staging and grading also on the basis of it. So can you share how can we do it? Like Basically, if you do MR spectroscopy, the spectral characteristic changes, the water okay. fat ratio changes. So we can actually find out uh, uh, T1 stage, what will be the water to fat ratio. And if you are determining the codeine, you can determine the codeine concentration, what will be the cutoff value to determine the T1, T2, T3 cycles. But from imaging, we can measure a lot of other characteristics. Characteristics like the volume, the diameter, uh, the characteristics, perfusion characteristics, everything can be measured uh, at, at each stage in a group of patients and then come up with this one. But because it involves a lot of laborious work, many people did not do that. So it's all about the, uh, everybody does histopathology only. Histopathology. So we are the only one who are concentrating on MR spectroscopy to find out this stage. But from a major characteristic, the radiologist normally gives, uh, depending upon whether it impinges upon other structures and all, they will give you whether it is T1, T2, T3 stages. But we rely finally on gold standard histopathology. <laughs> Yeah. Hello, sir. Uh, sir, I have a question about seven lithium. Uh, my first question is about diffusion. What gradient you have used? What? Gradient strength? Depends upon the magnetic field, what yes. we are using. 1.5 Tesla. The gradient strength that we use is 40 milli Tesla per meter. And the general gradient strength, okay? Mm. These are basically diffusion gradients which are of the milli tesla, mm -hmm. okay? So that will depend upon whether we are using at 1.5 and 3 tesla. It's a normal, not the one that you do in the regular NMR. Yeah. yeah, so like in 7 lithium, you have done just chemical shift on bits of chemical shift. Mm -hmm. You have uh, talked about that how it varied day 1, day 5. So uh, is it Not possible? on chemical shift, we measured with a standard. Uh, yes, sir. Ah. sir uh, is it possible that you might have looked upon diffusion of 7 lithium at that field? See, that's a good question. Diffusion also happens when we are doing the spectroscopy. But the time scale is different. Mm -hmm. So we don't worry about it. So, but 7 lithium, lithium is highly dynamical, right? Ah. So, sir, so, uh, doing diffusion at your Tesla, that ah. field, 1.5 Tesla, yeah. is it? Is it good to do or what? What do you mean by good to do? Good to do, yeah. like we, do we get a, uh, can we quantify something? Reliable. Yeah, 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 it is reliable. So, yes sir. It, it is reliable. See, whatever the diffusion it is happening, it doesn't matter. See, we are measuring it from the whole brain. Okay, okay. Whole brain. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, it is not a voxel spectroscopy. It is from the whole brain. Uh, okay. Whole brain concentration. We have not localized which region it is. So we get a grass picture. There may be diffusion. Actually, diffusion spectroscopy is also there. Also, sir, uh, when you take a brain image at 3 Tesla, suppose I have two, uh, two images. One is at 3 Tesla, second is at 7 Tesla. Uh. Uh, what is the difference? The sensitivity at 7 mm. Tesla increases mm. and you get a high resolution. Mm. And I can go for very, very thin slices. Very okay. thin slices. Yeah. Like up to about in today's thing, 300 microns we can have to go. 
0.3 millimeter. Okay, so should we look upon that in future we will have multi-nuclear MR systems? Multi-nuclear you can have it, but uh, the problem with uh, all the other nuclei is the abundance. low abundance oh, yes. and relative sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So these play a very important role. Yeah. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, anything else? Sir, uh, choline uh, here is the marker for breast uh, tissues. Uh, we, uh, for other tissues like pancreatic membrane or pancreatic cell, did this choline can be used? Because in, the membrane in most tumors, choline is a biomarker. Okay. So it's not only specific to breast cancer. Uh, yeah, e even in brain cancer, choline peak will be higher. Wherever there is a tumor, the membrane uh, structure is damaged. Okay. okay, when the membrane structure is damaged, free choline, GPC, PC, all are released. And what we are measuring is a total choline. Basically, it is called total choline. Combination of free choline, PC and GPC. Okay. We cannot identify which one it is because we are operating at a low field. But from cell line studies, people have found out most of the contribution comes from phosphocholine. Yeah, uh, because there are yeah. in pancreatic membrane, there yeah, is in phosphatic Every tumor choline will be high. Whether mm -hmm. it is prostate cancer also, breast cancer, colon cancer, HCC, brain cancer, everything choline will be high. Okay. It is not a specific biomarker for breast alone. Uh, sir, can we predict the chances of affecting cancer using this imaging techniques? Can you repeat? Can we predict the chances of affecting for getting cancer? Is there uh, any parameter? See, for uh, MRI is not a screening modality. Which patient you will subject to MRI? And which part you will subject to MRI? Each part, if I have to do it, 40 minutes. So I cannot screen the whole body. Only if there is an indication, we do the whole body scanning, which uh, I think uh, you showed one slide, right? Yeah. Under circumstances where there is a metastasis formed, we do the whole body diffusion weighted imaging. Unless otherwise, we don't do screening. MRI is not a screening modality. Neither any of the radiological techniques. Uh, sir, one more doubt. You mentioned that uh, according to person, it varies like uh, physiological and anatomical parameters and you uh, selected a normal person for the like you mentioned normal and affected person so in that case is there any uh, like common parameters that normal person should uh, like it will be like this or something yeah. like that yeah 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 whether we do diffusion whether we do dynamic contrast or MR spectroscopy or regular imaging we have a standard normal uh, volunteer thing we have we, we have these parameters we, we know what it is for a normal it should be. And uh, the reason I am telling you in MR advantage is that I don't have to have a separate group of volunteers. The okay. same individual will, suppose there is a brain tumor in one hemisphere, the other hemisphere will serve as a control. So I will compare it like I showed yeah. multi-voxel spectroscopy, no? within the breast itself, only the cancer portion will be different, normal portion will show a different characteristic. Yeah whether it is a diffusion or dynamic or a bar spectroscopy. So you will find the difference. So if I do the diffusion, then I will find out the kinetic parameters in the normal portion, which are the tumor portion, then I will compare okay. it with the normal. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, you told us about the benefits of MRI or other techniques like CT or PET. So no technique is perfect. What are the some limitations of MRI over these techniques as compared See, to... See, you yourself answered the question. No technique is uh, foolproof. But if we take 100% as the total one, most of the cases up to 85-90% you can solve it with MRI. Okay. Because most of the tumors are soft tissue related. Till even today, for any bone tumors, bone related abnormalities, it is the CT scan which is much better. And the physician will decide which technique to be used for the particular patient. Even like for example, breast cancer, even mammography is enough. Why do you need uh, MRI? It's a costly modality. So the physician will decide. And one thing is that because of your own statement, each technique complements each other. They are not competing with each other, they complement each other. Thank you. Sir. Anything else? Oh, yeah. That's 
सर कैन वी ऑल्सो स्क्रीन द इंट्रा ट्यूमर माइक्रोब्स दैट आर प्रेजेंट इन द ट्यूमर यूजिंग दिस एम आर आई इंट्रा ट्यूमर माइक्रोब्स इन अ रिसेंट स्टडी फ्रॉम द सेल प्रेस इट वॉज फाउंड दैट द ट्यूमर इन देर इज देर आर सम काइंड ऑफ माइक्रोब्स प्रेजेंट इन दिन साइड द ट्यूमर See, whatever we measure in MRI is only after some structural damage has been done by the cells. Okay. MRI will only give morphological changes. In certain circumstances, like in uh, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer, alcoholism, the MR spectroscopy is uh, much more useful in the reason that you can detect biochemical changes much earlier than. structural damage happens okay. but then you cannot subject everybody to mrs or mri that's okay. a limitation but so there can be many uh, biomarkers that are present on that uh, microbes that there may, there may be but what you see is a gross uh, features only you cannot find out uh, thing like for example when the, the department of nmr in mri facility was opened in aims many of the doctors comes to us and say can you i am giving some drug say paracetamol 500 mg can you measure it no i cannot measure it because 500 mg of paracetamol contains how many hydrogens but the human body contains billions of hydrogen so it is like uh, dissolving the paracetamol in a ocean so whatever we actually determined by mri and mr spectroscopy is basically the effect of it not the direct cause of it so sir uh, you said that water and fat ratio so why there is more water and less fat when we talk about the tumor thing yeah that's a good question basically when the tumor develops the cell swells swelling is what basically the whole part of it so that is why the tumor contains more water compared to normal tissue and especially in the case in advanced stage people develop whatever may be the cancer whether it is breast cancer or any cancer they develop pleural effusion the water the ca cancer cells multiply multiply and each cell has water so when when you have to have only 1 billion uh, cells but you have 10 billion cells what will happen the water accumulates so that is the reason why tumor cells has more water other materials that is why we have to suppress when we do uh, the spectroscopy the contribution of water and fat fat is also there in most of the cases especially in breast so we have to suppress both the contributions because the water molar concentration is about 50 molar compared to millimolar or micromolar quantities of the choline it's millimolar basically around 7 8 4 3, between 2 to 7 so when i have to do that i have to suppress the contribution of water and fat and do that and sir like you said fat and water so like when cells grow so ultimately more nucleic acid and more proteins so can we like we do study of that as well no i am telling you again again only the effect of it we are dealing with you cannot go into the micro details and image because the image is only a hydrogen image that comes mainly from the tissue water and fat mainly from tissue water whatever happens to the protein or macro molecules enzymes nothing it doesn't really matter for me because the technique is not that sensitive to pick up those changes my technique is only sensitive to pick up the hydrogens of the water in the tissues the effect of it may be seeing it suppose a larger effect comes and then affects the water like diffusion when when there is a lack of blood supply so oxygen is less and the oxygen is less the tissue water changes characteristic nature changes when the characteristic nature changes if you take a one particular motor cortex area there are lot of water and macro molecules nucleic acids enzymes proteins everything is there and the whole complete structure changes when the structure changes the diffusion of the hydrogen in the water changes that is what we measure basically thank you okay so i have Means many people talk about the sensitivity issues and especially 13C. 
are we are thinking or anybody is thinking about the combining dnp with mrr mrr yeah, yeah, it is there it is so, there so already hyper polarized mrr is there and also dnp but the problem doing it in vivo is uh, very limited that's mm-hmm. why most of the uh, uh, studies on dnp and hyper polarized mm-hmm. is confined only to animal model studies mm-hmm. especially like if you do hyper polarized uh, mm-hmm. uh, like pyruvate or carbon 13 mm-hmm. then in the time is also very less because when you hyper polarized it is there only for a minute mm-hmm. <laughs> so when you inject it mm-hmm. basically the hyper polarized no, no i know i'm not talking about the injectable i'm just pump, pumping the pump, mag- mag- magnet yeah, you cannot do it in real you cannot it's very, very And second thing, has anybody tried looking the P31 MRS? Yes, we have absolutely done. P31 uh-huh. can be done because the sensitivity is 0.8. Uh-huh. That's right. Like your P31 can be done, and you can measure the uh, basically the energy metabolism, all the ATPs, uh, PI, inner and uh, PI, uh, yeah, because I'm thinking PCR, it's everything. Because But there is a limitation. There. Mm-hmm. Limitation in the sense that uh, uh, it doesn't have much use for this, mm-hmm. and doing. single voxel takes much more time compared to uh, proton spectroscopy yeah, but why are you thinking with how metabolically more active the tumor cells are probably the if you can look at the atp signals or maybe uh, phospho signals yeah, yeah, yes yes so yes. then but that how aggressive that tumor could be yes yes people have done that people have not covered it but people have done that we uh-huh. initially did phospho spectroscopy and breast scans okay yeah, but we didn't pursue it phosphorus okay. can be done phosphorus carbon 13 has been done in limited cases because of very low sensitivity and abundance 1.1% mm-hmm. uh and phosphorus is mainly done fluorine and lithium because it mm-hmm. act less a tracer yes. element yes. so it is easier to pick up but then very confined to research sites not on a clinical site and the last question which i am in the metastatic stage normally you see this type 4 collagenase for and then crossing the barrier and then moving the thing the cancer cell moving so it crosses the barrier so can we predict by looking at the water structure that a particular tumor might go into the metastatic stage very soon more because the water structure could change if there is a could be a rupture there i don't have an answer i don't know hmm. it's a good question but one has to look into it but how do we look into it? problem in many of the in vivo type is remember one thing the patient is inside i cannot experiment so everything i have to do it in 30 45 45 minutes and get the results you miss if number and based on different patients and they go so do we see that a pattern that can be done yes looking yes. at the pattern up to looking at the pattern yeah somebody asked right whether no maybe we have so many data deposited so one can look at different and clinical data is already available now the with yeah that's what we no it's not one patient two three patient different patient have different stages and then one can look at maybe the data hmm. huh. huh. that's right yeah that like we have in 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 vitro the protein thing the data are deposited is there a repository where the clinical mri data anonymously with the clinic are deposited for anybody no. to do no ai Only based work no no uh, the reason uh, uh, many many fold reason is patient data is very uh, secret yeah. okay depositing in uh, any uh, depository thing uh, will violate the ethics so that is why most of the time some some of the functional mri images are put on uh, open site forum mm-hmm. with all permissions and everything but uh, patient data normally are not uh, provided uh, and, and they are not stored like a protein even anonymously no no only in multi centric studies when they do a multi center with proper approval mm-hmm. they will have data in its center. but not uh, as a regular protein like what you do in protein bank no ethical issues yeah, 
So thank you, thanks a lot for covering us such a huge field and answering almost all the questions uh, which, which you have. <laughs> Professor Vibhatan to just please state. Ah.